Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Sam Luoma. I'm, uh, as I mentioned in our first meeting, I'm chair of the National Academy of Science Committee on the Future of uh, Water Quality <clears throat> in Coeur d'Alene Lake. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this second meeting uh, in which we will be have two panel discussions, uh, one about water quality and data analysis, and one about water quality models. Uh, let me just reiterate for just a second uh, that uh, our, the focus of, our, of this particular study is on understanding the data and the trends that might establish an understanding that will allow us to uh, understand better what the future might hold for Lake Coeur d'Alene. We will not be discussing, discussing uh, solutions in this phase of the study. Uh, presumably, the base of understanding that we're developing, uh, we, of course, is necessary for any future discussion. Uh, along those lines. Uh, and I'd like to also remind you that the agenda, the task, our specific task and the bios of the committee are, are on the committee website. So let's get started and we'll go to the moderators for the panel. The first panel on discussion of available water quality analysis is moderated by Bob Hirsch of the US Geological Survey, retired. Thanks, Sam. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to get right into this uh, session. Um, our speakers this morning will, will be first Craig Cooper of uh, IDEQ, then Dale Chess of the Coeur d'Alene Tribe, and then third Lauren Zinser of, uh, of the US Geological Survey. In each of their talks, we're asking them to address uh, what is the data collection program now or roughly over the last 20 years? Um, and then what are some of the analyses and things that have been learned from the data collection program in terms of trends, both spatial and temporal trends. Uh, and, and then finally, some thoughts about some of the higher priorities of future monitoring efforts uh, in the watershed. So we'll get right to our first speaker, and that's Craig Cooper of the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, Craig is a senior scientist with the department um, and is the lead technical lead for limnological studies of the Coeur d'Alene Basin. So Craig, go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about the work we've done on Coeur d'Alene Lake. My name is Craig Cooper, and I am the monologist for DEQ here in Coeur d'Alene. Now, to start off, I'd like to begin by acknowledging my colleagues here, without whom this data would set would not be possible. The Lake Management Plan, Jamie Bruner, Glenn Pettit, and Bob Witherow, and also my colleagues in the Water Quality Group, Kristen Bowl and Craig Nelson, who have been big helps in collecting water quality data in the Coeur d'Alene Basin. Let's set the stage with this bathymetric map of the lake that shows the four major regions we think about in terms of discussing the lake. The southern pool is shallower and warmer, higher productivity, and predominantly influenced by the St. Joe River. As the St. Joe River water flows northward and intersects the Coeur d'Alene River, we get a the mixing zone that has complicated mixing between these two water masses. Then you get the central pool that is north-south and the lake gets broader and deeper. And then the northern pool that comes from the northwest to southeast and is least influenced by the river and has important influences from these smaller tributaries in the eastern part of this pool. Our monitoring plan is designed to accommodate for these bathymetric and geographic differences. We collect core monitoring data at C1 Tubbs in the northern pool and C4 University in the central pool. We also collect profile data every year and intermittent chemistry data at these orange data points. We have collected bay data at all of the open circles, and the blue circles represent places the USGS sampled in 1991-92. To the extent possible, our sampling locations coincide with the USGS sampling location to allow long-term trend analyses. For lake sampling, we've traditionally sampled seven to nine times per year with two rain on snow events in spring, monthly from May to September, again, lake turnover, and then when lake becomes isothermal, typically after Thanksgiving. That's changed over time to reflect newer data needs, so we now do regular monthly from March to September, as well as turnover in winter, picking up sun only, measuring in January and February. When we do monitoring, we get a secchi disk, as well as sun profiles of light penetration as well as standard chemical physical measures. 
We get water quality samples for chemistry from the photic zone, an integrated sample. Discrete samples are 20 meters, 30 meters, and one meter off the bottom or near bottom. We can change that for deeper sites, and we've also begun getting separate integrated samples from the epilemnion and the deep photic because in summertime from June to September, the photic zone can extend beneath the epilemnion. For our water quality parameters, we get total and dissolved metals, where dissolved is that which passes through a 0.45 micron filter. We also get total and dissolved measures of nitrogen and phosphorus. We've got chlorophyll A data, as well as phytoplankton and community structure. For DEQ, all of our data is publicly available upon request, and most of it is in the water quality database. DEQ collects data both in the lake and in the overall basin. For our lake management plan, we collected lake survey data from 95 to 2002. We've been monitoring at our core monitoring sites since 2007 and been collecting long-term SON profile monitoring at five additional sites. We've done short-term monitoring surveys at those sites since 2010, five pelagic sites, and 22 bay sites. We've also done some special studies. We've looked at isotopes of water to track the movement of water masses, seasonal anoxia in the far northwestern corner of the lake, which is a small anoxic basin. We looked at prime productivity rates at our core monitoring sites in the benthos with vegetation and vertebrates, and then a parafite and recruitment study with the University of Idaho with Dr. Frank Wilhelm and a student Randy Nadi. Elsewhere in the basin, we've done a survey of the CDA River Chain Lakes, worked with the tribe to do a profile study of the deep meander bends, we've done nutrient studies in both the St. Joe and St. Mary's River Basin and the Coeur d'Alene Lake tributaries a short survey in 2009, and we're now doing a current, more detailed study. We collected this phosphorus data for the Coeur d'Alene River banks, and also in 2017, when EPA did their river flood study, we worked with them to get phosphorus data for suspended sediments. We've also done studies for bank erosion in the Coeur d'Alene River and the St. Joe. With this data, we've done a number of assessments and special studies. I'd like to highlight that we have annual summaries of lake conditions for the state waters from 2008 to 11. And then we did some trend analyses lake-wide with the tribe with data through 2014 and 2015. Most recently, we've done a trend analysis for the state waters through 2018. For special studies, we recently finished a large basin-wide fossil inventory using data up to 2013, because that is the most recent year for which we have a consistent set of data across the entire basin. We've also done studies on benthic invertebrates, aquatic vegetation, primary productivity via carbon-14 uptake, trends in phytoplankton commu community. Also did the parafighting recruitment study with the University of Idaho, and we've also helped the University of Idaho do metal biology chemistry and lake sediments. Currently working on a report on the stable isotope work we did in 2015, and beginning to do an assessment of the conceptual mixing model for the lake. So let's move on to some of our challenges. In terms of data collection, it is a challenge to get a good long-term data set. The lake is not always easy to sample. With respect to methods, we're often at or below our detection limits for nutrient and chlorophyll A. We've been using different labs to try and DEQ, and that has impacted phosphorus in the past. We have had different methods for chlorophyll A analysis in the lake, where laboratory splits yield different results for the same water from different laboratories, different methods. We have three different chlorophyll A methods on the record, so we have to evaluate our trends using current methods and their historical equivalent values. In doing that, we have to account for potential biases from the historic analytical methods, seasonality and gaps in data record, and also potential bias from the focus on rain on snow events from our historic sampling schemes. There are challenges in data management, different agencies, different time periods, keeping track of all our data sets, and also the scope of the data versus our staff resources. We have a lot more data than staff time, so there are studies and assessments we want to get done but haven't gotten done yet. Now let's dive into some data, and I first will talk about geography and seasonality and start off with total phosphorus. Now, this plot in the upper right shows total phosphorus for all our data from 2004 to 2018 on a seasonal progression at C4 University Point in the Central Pool here in the red and Tubbs Hill the Northern Pool here in the green. You'll note that phosphorus is higher in the spring in both sites, declining down to summer minimum values. 
It's also much higher at University Point in the central pool than it is at Tubbs Hill in the northern pool. If you look at chlorophyll A, it's a different pattern. For chlorophyll, chlorophyll is higher at Tubbs Hill in the northern pool than it is at University Point in the central pool, which is interesting. Higher phosphorus in the central pool, higher chlorophyll in the northern pool. Also, when we did our carbon-14 uptake rate for summer productivity, we did find that productivity rates are higher in the summertime in the central pool closer to the river than they are in the northern pool, even though chlorophyll A levels are comparable. Let's take a look now at nitrogen. Like phosphorus, nitrogen is higher in the spring, dropping down to a summer minimum before rising again in the wintertime, though the sequence is a bit more pronounced. Nitrogen is also higher at C4 in the central pool than at C1 in the northern pool. Now with respect to the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, we see a distinct seasonality as well, where we have a very high NAP ratio during uh, spring and spring runoff, we also see diatom blooms. Ratio then drops precipitously in late spring to reach a minimum during the summertime, when our community also shifts to favor and have more blue-green algae. The ratio then increases in the wintertime as nitrogen levels increase. So what we see here is that we have a distinct seasonality in both the chemistry of the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio and in our phytoplankton community structure between diatoms and blue greens. So how do we assess our data? Well, we do two kinds of assessments. First, we ask, do we exceed the triggers and lake management plan? This would be a single annual value, be it a mean, be it a maximum, be it a minimum. And the means would be an average of multiple depths and sampling events. So for example, for total phosphorus, we ask, does a geometric mean over the entire year for all data sets, the upper 30 meters, is it greater or less than, than the trigger value of eight micrograms per liter? We also ask, is there a time trend over a time period? These are calculated for each combination of depth, location, and parameter. So for example, at Tubbs Hill, we have four depths. We have four different trends for edit that site. We use stochastic statistics because we do not have a normal distribution of data. And it goes to a seasonal cycle, high in the spring, low in the summer, high in the spring, low in the summer, with the peak in the spring not being consistent from year to year. We can also have different size data sets. So for example, a long data set here since 04 is consistent. And this USGS data set back here in 9192 that's much shorter. Our Stat analyses exclude samples less than reporting limit, attacking that problem. We do three kinds of calculations. We do a man and Kindle calculation to determine whether or not there's a trend and how significant it is. We use a teal sin regression to the median to determine the magnitude of the trend. And for the case of we're comparing two disparate data sets, we use a man whitney wilcox calculation. Now, let's look at zinc. Zinc exceeds our targets on an annual average basis every year, and it's always higher at C4 in the central pool than the northern pool. Zinc is declining consistently across all sites with an average decline of about one microgram per liter per year. And we've declined far enough now so that in the summertime, zinc drops below the Idaho chronic criteria at both Tubbs Hill and University Point. Cadmium is broadly similar to zinc. It's declining at both sites of the Northern Lake consistent across all depths and sites. Cadmium levels are lower relative to the chronic standard than our zinc and the point now where we are generally below that standard, only exceeding the chronic criteria on a seasonal basis at some locations. And on an annual average basis, we are below our targets, so cadmium is improving. Lead is a more nuanced trend than with zinc and cadmium. It's always higher in the central pool, close to the Coeur d'Alene River than Tubbs Hill, the northern pool. And we never exceed the criteria on an annual basis at, at Tubbs Hill. However, we do have, see historic exceedances for lead on an annualized basis at University Point, closer to the Coeur d'Alene River. Trends are mixed. They're either upward or no trend depending on site and depth. So for example, at Tubbs Hill in the photic zone, there is no trend for lead over time. However, if we look at University Point at 30 meters depth, there is an increasing trend in dissolved lead over time. Note here the logarithmic scale because you get a very large range in dissolved lead concentrations from spring to summer, with the largest ranges being closer to the Coeur River at University Point. 
Note that at both locations, we do exceed our lead chronic criteria seasonally in the, at all depth locations. Phosphorus. We are currently exceeding our phosphorus target on an annual average basis at both University Point and Tubbs Hill. And the phosphorus concentration is always higher closer to the river. Our, we are trending upward with the rate of change being different at different sites and locations, but consistently upward at all locations with a range of between 0.2 and 1 half microgram per liter per year. Note that there is no numeric standard for total phosphorus in Idaho. So the target here that I'm showing you is the lake management plan trigger of an annual geometric mean of eight micrograms per liter. Take a moment to talk about nitrogen. Now, nitrogen's not consistently higher or lower at either site, and there's no measurable long-term trend. Now, if we have no long-term trend in nitrogen and an increasing trend in total phosphorus, we're now getting a decreasing trend in nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. That means that over, as time progresses, we're getting a higher risk for harmful algae blooms and increasing risk of cyanotoxins. This is an emerging water quality concern. For chlorophyll A, we look at two different measures. Is the annual maximum value greater than five micrograms per liter? And is the annual geometric mean greater than or equal to three micrograms per liter? The plots I've given you here are based on the current method we use since 2014 and its historic equivalent of what that would have been if today's method had been used back then. We have rarely exceeded the target for maximum chlorophyll A, and here only at Tubbs Hill twice in our history. We've never exceeded it for the geometric mean chlorophyll A, and always chlorophyll A is high at Tubbs Hill in the northern pool and University Point in the central pool. Now for chlorophyll A, we do not see a trend for the current method and its historic equivalent. However, there is a caveat to that. And that is historic method yielded higher chlorophyll A values than the current wood does on sample splits. That means that using historic method would have had more exceedances and also had more pronounced trends. So in an earlier report, when we looked at trends through 2014 and 15, using the historic equivalent as a basis for our trend calculations, we did see a potential increasing trend in chlorophyll A. Take home for this is that we do not see a discernible trend in chlorophyll A, but our methods are not very sensitive and we cannot discount the potential for there to be a trend smaller than we can measure. Now for hypoluminetic oxygen, the LMP assesses that as a minimum value measured at one meter above the bottom. That should not drop below six micrograms per liter. We have really exceeded that target only twice and only at Tubbs Hill, the Northern Pool, where oxygen levels are always lower in the northern pool than in the central pool. For a trend, it varies with the reporting period. We have not seen a trend for either location from 91 to 2018 or 2004, 2018. However, in a prior report in 2015, we did see a potential declining trend in oxygen only at Tubbs Hill in the northern pool. So here with oxygen, the trend can vary depending upon the time period you select, and it can be different between different sites. The bottom line being, we do not see a trend in oxygen, but we also cannot discount the possibility for one to be present that's too small for our methods to discern. Let's put this all together, and in doing so, I'm gonna revisit the trend slide that Jamie shared on Wednesday. And here my take home is that there is a very large step change in trends as you move north of the Coeur d'Alene River. Cadmium and zinc decreasing north of the river, very different trends south of the river. Lead and phosphorus increasing north of the river, very different trends south of the river. Chlorophyll A and oxygen hypolimnion, no real change north of the river, different trends south of the river. And this is a very important distinction to keep in mind as we move forward and start developing management plans on how we address our phosphorus issues. Let's focus a bit now on phosphorus. If we look more closely and look at the rates of change at University Point the Central Pool versus the Northern Pool, there is an apparently very small difference in that phosphorus may be increasing faster in the Northern Pool than in the Central Pool. 
I bet it's a very, very small difference with relatively large error bars and you need to be very careful in interpreting it this way. What we can be more sure of is that phosphorus is increasing at a rate of approximately 2 to 5 percent of its annual geometric mean or its annual median per year. A slow steady uptick that we need to slow down and reverse in order to protect the lake. What's our path forward? Overall, we've made progress. Zinc and cadmium are going down. That's a good thing. We're getting close to our water quality criteria. But they're emerging new challenges and new threats. Phosphorus is going up steadily. The lake is turning away from its oligotrophic status. That means we can take additional actions now to protect the lake. This is a large basin, and it will take time to do sufficient actions to keep the lake in its preferred state. We can get sufficient nutrient control to keep the metals trapped in the sediments and protect water quality from emerging threats such as blue-green algae and invasive species. What is sufficient? What does that mean? One way to define this is what is a water quality risk envelope for a zero metals condition? Because if you can protect water quality when there's no metals, you also protect it when there are metals that inhibit productivity. What load targets do we have to hit to stay within that envelope, both from a total load perspective and a geographic perspective that accounts for different source areas? Factor in the challenges from development and climate change. And then how do we hit those targets? What are some proven strategies from lessons learned elsewhere? What are some innovative outside the box strategies we can use here that address our non-point source loading problem? With that, I thank you for your time and attention and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. And you came in right on time. So we have a, a few minutes for some questions. So if uh, uh, members of the committee or other panelists would like to raise questions, just raise your hand, use the raise hand feature in Zoom and we'll uh, call you as we see your hand come up. Michael Brett. Um, yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, one is, what's the water residence time of Coeur d'Alene? It's probably already been mentioned, but I don't remember that. And um, yes. Oh, sorry. On that, is the annual average is six months, though there is a very strong pronounced seasonality in that. In the peak runoff, it can be as short as 90 days, getting up to about 1,100 days during the summer time um, when we're in a stratified condition. Okay, and one more. Um, I think it would be very useful to also report the oxygen values as um, a volume weighted hypolimnetic mean for the, you know, the minimum hypolimnetic volume weighted value, as opposed to just one meter off the bottom. Um, yes, thank you. We've uh, done those calculations, and I just didn't get today's talk for time reasons. Thank you. Great. Uh, James Elser. Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, ask what the detection limit for the total phosphorus and uh, reactive phosphorus uh, method that you're using. For total phosphorus, um, our reporting limit is four micrograms per liter. Our detection varies from two to three with our current methods. It's very different under historic methods. It was a higher detection limit. Currently for orthophosphorus, our detection is one microgram per liter with a reporting limit of two micrograms per liter. And again, it's much lower than it was under short uh, methods. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bill Arnold. I actually have two questions. The, the first one is, do you monitor sulfate and sulfide in the water of the lake? And the second is, uh, do you have information about the composition and the mineralogy of the sediments in different lake compartments? Ah, okay, uh, we do monitor sulfate as we get that as part of our standard suite when we get nitrate and nitrite. For sulfide, we don't measure it as a regular part of our monitoring because the lake is oxic year round. However, we have gotten sulfide data for that anoxic base in the northern pool during our special study that we did there uh, a few years back. And on mineralogy, uh, DEQ does not sample the sediments on a regular basis, so internally we don't have that. So the USGS did a study of mineralogy that's quite extensive back, I believe, in the 1990s. Thank you. Okay, um, Jeff Shredhall.
Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you have seen any trends in algal speciation, uh, first of all, and could you just um, confirm for me whether, uh, I think you said you measure seven to nine times a year. Is that, could you just tell me what, what period of the year those, those measurements cover? Uh, okay, well, first on the algae, we do have data, good data back to only 2007, and there are some one-off studies earlier than that. In our data that we did, our analysis we did since 2007, we did see a trend in that there was a very large um, disturbance, uh, big step change we had in those two flood years in 07 and 08, where we had a fair amount of blue-green algae coming in the spring. But since then, it's been fairly stable uh, with no long-term trends since about 2010. Though the method we used may not have caught any very small changes since 2010 because you looked at the overall data set and a very large perturbation in 07 and 08. Um, and what was your other question? I've lost track of it. I, I guess I, I think I heard you say you measure seven to nine times a year. I was just one, wondering whether, well, what, the, what time of year that covers. Ah. Thank you. Um, historically, at Lake Management Plan, we would collect two sampling events on, during rain on snow events during February and April, from February to April. We wouldn't get samples if there weren't a rain on snow event. Then we went monthly from May to September. We pick up a sampling event in uh, turnover during October, early November. And then we would get a winter sampling event, um, usually at end of November, early December when they're isothermal. There were times when we didn't get out and get samples from logistical purposes. Uh, more recently, we've moved to a regular monthly sampling from March through September, rather than focusing on rain on snow events, again in turnover and again in winter. And most recently, we've started getting sun only data in January and February to get some more winter data. Sorry, one, one last question. The yes. sun you use, is that providing continuous, uh, I guess, spatial measurements, sort of measuring at a high frequency, or is it a, at discrete depths? We can get high frequency spatial data, but we've been using it at discrete depths to be consistent with the way they did it when we first started back in 07 and 08. Okay, thank you. Yes. We have time for just one more question. Sam Luoma. Let's let Lynn Jakers. Oh, okay, Lynn, Lynn Katz. Uh, Hold on. Oh, uh, shoot. Um, there I am. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So I was sort of curious about the anoxia study and what, um, you know, you mentioned that you me measured some sulfate, sulfide as well as sulfate. I was wondering what other speciation you were able to look at there that would give some insight into um, that. that. Thank you. Uh, we weren't able to get speciation. We only got sulfide with a field colorimeter. We also got iron two as part of that in our standard uh, metal and um, biological sampling. We weren't able to do a really focused time study. We tied on those analyses during our regular sampling runs. We did, did get in a few extra runs that focused on finer profiles. Does that cover your question, Lynn? Yeah, that helps. Thanks, gives me a picture okay. of what's the best. Thanks everyone, uh, it's time to move on to our uh, Next speaker, and just remind people that, of course, during the committee process, there'll be many occasions, I think, we'll probably come back with questions to these speakers and others uh, to getting into much more of the detail. But this has been a great way to get uh, begin to get a, a, a feel for things. Our next speaker is Dale Chess. He's a limnologist with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. He's been with the tribe uh, in their lake management department since the year 2003. So I'll turn it over to Dale. Thank you. Let's see here. Okay. Um, so what I want to begin with is uh, describing the tribe's uh, data that's available to the committee, and then uh, present a, a subset of uh, water quality results uh, from the data sets. Hey Dale, I'm sorry for interrupting. So we're seeing yeah. um, your your presenter view, not the slide view. If you're using two monitors, if you go up to display settings at the top there. Yes. And then click that and click on uh, swap the first one, swap presenter view and slideshow. 
Does that help? No, we're still stuck there. Um, in ah. Zoom, if you can re redo the share, but select the slideshow if you already have it in presenter mode. So if you stop your sharing and then reshare and um, the applications that are available, you should see this, the actual slideshow. Oh, excuse me, I, I messed that up. Let's see, let's try this. Is that better? Right now you're not sharing anything, right? You're, yeah, right now you're not sharing anything. Ah, okay. Let me back out here. Excuse me for this. This is. Okay. What do I need to do? So in Zoom, click your your green share button. Right now, I don't have. Okay, there we go. Let's see here. Okay, share. Right, and then uh, out of the applications available, you should see your PowerPoint slideshow. Yes, yes, I do. Double click that and go in presenter mode. Okay, now let's see. Now I can start the slideshow. Okay, excuse me. How about that? There we go, perfect, all set. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, so what I'd like to begin with is uh, begin with uh, the uh, data sets that are available to the committee uh, from the data that we collected, and then uh, present a subset of some of the results from those data sets. Okay, so uh, in the uh, southern half of the system, uh, for our long-term data sets, we've sampled uh, St. Joe River at a deep meander bend site, uh, sampled Chat Colette, which is 11 meter site in Chat Colette Lake, and then in the southern pool, the southern pelagic pool site C5, which is an 18 meter uh, deep site. In uh, 2019, we added the uh, lower Coeur d'Alene River, which, has, which is at the USGS and BEMP site, and that's right around here by the Coeur d'Alene River, by the D in the Coeur d'Alene River uh, label. Okay, so on the left here is the sampling periods, just, just the general condition of the lake at that time. January and February, we can be, uh, or the, the lake can be cold and clear. It can be cold and turbid. Uh, there usually is some ice cover. Uh, some years there's rain on snow events during that time period and then peaks in the hydrograph. Uh, in March and April, generally hydrograph driven processes uh, in the southern part of the lake. Uh, May and June, we have uh, mixing and the beginning of weak uh, thermal stratification. In July through October, initial summer, uh, stronger stratification, and then uh, weakening <clears throat> stratification in the fall. In November and December, we have uh, significant cooling and then mixing. On the right here, this table shows uh, from that time period of, of our long-term data set uh, from 2007 through 2020, it shows the breakout of number of times, uh, or the breakout by month, the number of times we've sampled. So as you can see, it's, it's a heavily, um, during the summertime, spring, summer, and then fall, and in the wintertime, we have fewer samples. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that like Craig said early on in the process, we were we were um, we were kind of uh, sampling more of the uh, rain and snow events. Uh, now we're beginning to sample or attempting to sample more in winter time. But as you can see in this image, the southern part of the system is froze. Uh, there's significant ice cover all the way up to uh, the uh, east point, uh, central part of the lake. Uh, this is from 2017, late January of 2017, and we had similar uh, ice cover in 2019. Now, some years, it'll only, the ice cover will only extend uh, from Conkling up into C5 zone, and it'll be uh, kind of rotten ice. It's not, not very good condition. There's no way you can actually uh, move on the ice uh, in this area of, of the lake. In the southern part, people do ice fishing here in Chat Colette and then the St. Joe River uh, it freezes uh, almost every year, even during mild winters, we'll get some kind of ice cover. 
Okay, so um, now I'm going to show you a couple slides, uh, tables on, on the, what we're collecting and where or at what depths. Uh, every time we collect chemistry samples, we do profiles. And uh, our profiles are at one meter resolution at the deeper sites. If we have a site or when we sample sites that are less than 10 meters in depth, we uh, use uh, 0.5 meter increments. Uh, we're collecting the, the uh, standard uh, physical chemical variables, temperature, DOPH, specific conductance, fluorescence, and PAR. We also have a uh, automated buoy profiler system that we've deployed mostly in the summertime or from June through November. Uh, at site C5, uh, we've collected data there. Or we've had a buoy uh, in, the, in the system in 2011 and 2015. At site C6, we've had that profiler a buoy in, uh, at site C6, uh, or at, excuse me, in the years 2014 and 2018. Those are collecting uh, temperature, DO, pH, and specific conductance. Also, uh, in 2018, we began doing CTD profiles with a, just a small YSI, um, the little orange pill uh, CTD um, at every site when we collected water, uh, water chemistry samples. Uh, just real quick, we also have three weather stations, one at East Point, one at Shingle Bay uh, Point, and then one at Chat Collette in the southern part of the system. Those are collecting data or logging data every five minutes. Okay, so we collect metals, uh, total recoverable and a 0.45 micron filtered from the photozone composite, which is a, um, it's a five, it's five distinct grabs uh, at uh, equal distance uh, in the photic zone. So let's say the photic zone is nine meters deep. We would uh, grab a sample at uh, one, three, five, seven, and uh, nine meters. And then we combine those in a churn splitter and uh, filter from there. We also sample one meter above the bottom. And beginning in 2017, we started to do an, an epilimbium composite because, as Craig had mentioned previously, uh, uh, many times the photic zone will extend through the uh, epilimbium and uh, actually through the, the metalimbium, in some cases, into the hypolimbium. So it, uh, it kind of clouds that photic zone uh, sample. Uh, the epilimbium sample, of course, uh, collects that water that's uh, being mixed in the upper water column. As Craig mentioned, lead, cadmium, zinc, arsenic, iron, manganese, uh, magnesium, and calcium. Uh, we do uh, collect, uh, there was a question earlier, uh, sulfate. We do collect sulfate all, or analyze for sulfate also. For nutrients, total phosphorus, orthophosphate, total dissolved phosphorus, uh, total nitrogen, ammonia, nitrate, and chlorophyll A. And uh, beginning in 2019, uh, we started to collect uh, total organic carbon and dissolved organic carbon at these sites. I think one of the strengths of both these data sets of the, of the, of the of Craig's data set and ours is that we have phytoplankton composition, uh, taxonomy, and counts every time or near every time we collect chemistry data. Also, one of the, another strength is generally um, there have been mixing of labs at some point. Uh, I think IDQ has, has, has maybe used a couple different labs. We've used uh, Shimmikin Creek Laboratory, which IDQ also uses. Uh, we've used that laboratory since the beginning. Uh, EPA Manchester Laboratory has done all of our metal samples. And uh, one taxonomist at Advanced Eco Solutions has done all of the, uh, all, all the phytoplankton work. Okay, now to some data. Uh, this is uh, chlorophyll A in, at site C5, that southern pelagic site. Uh, this time series uh, shows uh, no significant trend of, uh, given a, or using a man candle test. The maximum is uh, generally between three and four uh, micrograms per liter. And in many years, that maximum is in late fall. Uh, we've had a maximum chlorophyll of at C5 in December. On to zinc. So this is a 0.45 micron filtered zinc at site C5. 
the uh, there's two two figures here. The top figure is the photic zone. The bottom, or and the bottom figure is one meter above the bottom. Uh, the bottom is uh, has a higher concentration, shows a higher concentration of zinc, and uh, it's significantly higher in the summertime as compared to the floating zone. Uh, one thing to notice is this this real dramatic seasonal effect uh, below detection uh, or below reporting limits of five micrograms per liter many years or most years in the spring, and then increasing throughout the summer. Uh, to uh, some high levels. In fact, these levels here, or these, excuse me, these concentrations here are actually higher than the northern, than some of the northern pool samples you'll see during the summertime. So the zinc concentration is actually higher at C5 in that southern zone at times as compared to the northern pool. Another way to look at that is to uh, just uh, break out all the sample points and compare the bottom versus the floating zone um, from a day of year standpoint on the x-axis. Uh, this shows that seasonality. This is the lowest fit um, at, with the shaded area being 95% confidence intervals. And once again, as I, um, as I said before, uh, significantly higher concentrations later in the summer and that increases throughout the summer from these lower samples uh, near detection limits, actually, uh, in the early spring. So a couple of questions is why? What's driving this? Um, is it hydrodynamics? Is it being resupplied from the, the uh, central pool from the north? Uh, or is it, uh, or, or could it be, excuse me, enhanced uh, benthic flux from the low dissolved oxygen at the bottom at C5. Okay, in this slide, we're comparing the St. Joe River hydrograph from 2011 here in the blue and 2015 in the orange. And I picked these two years because they show how just how different the magnitude or the intensity of the hydrograph can be, the high variability year in and year out uh, from the St. Joe River, and that directly affects site C5 and, and the entire lake actually. Uh, during that time period, we, uh, from the buoy profiler dissolved oxygen data, uh, uh, where the sensor was, uh, was collecting data at uh, 16 to 17 meters, this shows the minimum dissolved oxygen concentration uh, at the, or near the bottom for those two years. As you can see, in 2011, uh, there still is a sag. There's a sag at Site C5, a, a DO depletion sag at Site C5 every year regardless of hydrograph. But in 2011, there was later uh, stratification, thermal stratification development, uh, and uh, the water was much cooler later into the early summer, and uh, uh, later stratification and the DO sag isn't as prominent or as intense as in 2015, which is a low, low flow year. Uh, it stratified early, and as you can see, the DO depletion rate was quite significant down to uh, 1.5 milligrams per liter on the 11th of October 2015. One thing I want to point out also are these spikes here in the hydrograph. Both years had rain on snow events, different intensity, but both significant. And this is, this is uh, sometimes it's common. We've been through the last few years, we've been through a period of lower, or I should say less intense, small thaws, but nothing like these types of rain on snow events from earlier in the sampling. Okay, this slide's busy, and uh, excuse me for, for making this busy slide. However, I just wanted to show or, or give, give the panel one slide that they can go back and look at for reference of some of the uh, special studies and the data that's available from these special studies. We looked at the lower Coeur d'Alene River uh, uh, meander bends and the effect of anoxia on, uh, on the uh, release of metals and nutrients in the system. Uh, we compared the inundated lower river, uh, deeper sections versus the free-flowing Catalgo section because there's quite a difference in the amount of total lead, for instance, in the lower river com compared to that upper lower part of a free-flowing segment. One of the keys that I think are important parts of this data set is that we have total uh, metals. We have the 0.45 fraction, but we also have a 0.1 micron filtered fraction. So I, I believe we have the ability to estimate the particulate 
the, uh, the uh, colloidal and the uh, approaching or the ionic uh, form of those metals from this 2015 uh, study. Uh, there's two reports for, or there's one report for each one of these two studies. And uh, let's see, in 2019, we did the, uh, uh, we collaborated with IBQ, uh, the state, and uh, we did a uh, uh, dissolved oxygen synoptic uh, at uh, 25 meander bends in the lower river. Let's see, for the latter lakes, we pretty much looked at the summertime limnology of uh, Thompson and Swan Lakes, a couple of different lakes. Uh, we can talk about that later, how those lakes differ, uh, but we looked at uh, metals, nutrients, DOC, and uh, chlorophyll. Also in 2015, we um, uh, analyzed for uh, zooplankton metals burden, which I'll show here later. We have profiles in most of the uh, lateral lakes throughout the years, um, usually during the summertime, but they extend, they can extend from spring through early fall until it's difficult to get back into those lateral lakes because of lake drawdown. We have metals in the macrophytes from some of the uh, lateral lakes. And uh, once again, in 2019, we, we, we um, did more of a limnological investigation or, or a little more intense investigation in Thompson Swan Lakes and looked at uh, metals in the uh, particulate organic matter. Also, we uh, sampled for, or, or analyzed for uh, TOC and DOC. In the uh, lower St. Joe River, our low metals reference area, we uh, have Benoit Lake and Round Lake where we've collected data from 2011 through 2020, uh, from June through October at those two sites. In uh, 2020, we have some, uh, we added some DOC and TOC at those sites. And then another synoptic in 2020 of the 12 meander bend sites in the lower St. Joe River. This is a uh, map of the Coraline River. The, these dots here, uh, the meander bends are the uh, sample sites for the dissolved oxygen synoptics that we've done. Here's Swan Lake, Thompson Lake. This is the lower river site. Um, it's the, uh, excuse me, it's the BEMP, the BEMP and the EPA's USGS gauge site. Uh, here's, uh, here's Harrison, the city of Harrison, and uh, Black Lake here. All, all of these uh, we've done work on. And uh, then for reference, here's site C5 in that southern basin. Hell, about two minutes. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm move these pretty fast. These are the effect, or this is the effect of anoxia on metal liberation in those in some of those meander bend sites in the Coeur d'Alene River. Uh, one of the things to look at here is this uh, thermal stratification. It doesn't look real significant, but it's enough stratification to drive this deal uh, deal depletion in those meander bends. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, once again, in the lateral lakes. Anoxic hypolimnians with uh, um, high concentrations of total metals and total phosphorus. Total phosphorus here. The red is the hypolimnian. Okay, this this iron and manganese uh, part of the figure is in milligrams per liter. The rest is in micrograms per liter. So there is about 23 milligrams per liter of total iron in the hypolimnian of Thompson Lake. This is what it looks like in the churn splitter. This gray. This gray water here, <clears throat> excuse me, this is in 2018 after turnover in Thompson Lake, what it looks like after turnover and mixing. About another um, minute. Okay, this is the uh, um, metals in zooplankton, metals burden in zooplankton in Thompson Lake. This is lead. This is cadmium, Thompson versus Swan. And I'm going to move on to the uh, dissolved oxygen synoptics in the lower river. So in 2019, uh, 15 of, 20, of 25 of the sites we sampled were anoxic in the lower Coeur d'Alene River. And in the St. Joe River in 2020, 10 of the 12 sites we sampled were anoxic uh, in uh, September. And I'll just uh, leave it at that. These are my summary points in my presentation, and you can look at those. I'll just, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight these. So the first one is high seasonal variability of zinc in the southern part of the system. In the lower Coraline and uh, uh, St. Joe River systems, we have hypoxic and anoxic meander bends during uh, thermal stratification. Uh, in the latter lakes, even with a stew of metals contamination, the latter lakes uh, are quite productive. 
And one general trend throughout the basin to think about is that the uh, zinc to phosphorus ratio is decreasing in the lake and, uh, and basin wide. And I think that's one of those metrics we really need to look at closely. Okay, and thank you. Thanks, Dale. So we'll now we'll go to questions. Um, let me bring up the screen there. So please raise your hand if you have a question. Let's see, Alejandro Flores. Thank you for that presentation. Um, the yeah, I have um, one question about the the Met stations that you um, the slide that you had on the Met stations. Um, I noted that for two of them there was a tw uh, 2019 um, end date, and so I was wondering if that indicated that either uh, the data is no longer being collected at that site, or that's just sort of the end date through which QAQC data is available. And I also noted that um, there's solar radiation indicated at those sites. And I wonder if there's any net radiation data available at any of those sites. Okay, so for those, for those sites, uh, the, the Chat Collette site, so the, 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 the furthest southern site is currently operating. That site is collecting data. And, uh, but for the uh, Shingle Bay Point site near site C5 and the East Point site, those stations are not collecting data now. Uh, basically what happened was uh, we haven't been able to really get to them and, and, and fund to get the new batteries and the solar systems for them. They, they pretty much run out of their, their, um, their uh, cycle. Um, we, we, we are gonna get the stations up and running again. We have new anemometers, you know, so um, they, will be up, they will be collecting data once again. Okay, uh, Allison Cullen. Thanks, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just intrigued by something. I know that USGS has done some work on wildfire and water quality, and um, they are definitely picking up metals in water related to wildfires. And we've had some really big seasons here in the Northwest, and certainly I'm, I'm further west of, of you all, but um, I'm just wondering, are you seeing any of that sort of impact? I, I know you're you know, peaking with some of these metals in the late summer, and that's like, that's our fire season, right? The August, September. Maybe it's not enough of a signal against the signal of the waste that's already there, but it's kind of intriguing. And I'm just wondering if you see that or if you think that's related to any of um, the trending that you see. Well, I think it's really tied to the, I mean, part of, part of that issue is that when we have, when we tend to have, uh, you know, high fires of, or, or a lot of fires, that's during a time period when the hydrograph is, is really low. I mean, the intensity is really low summer, you know, low summer flows. And, uh, and I think those, those fires also, uh, there's, there's a correlation between the fires and then snowpack. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, you know, the, the, there's a real elevation uh, gradient in this system. And uh, I think that, you know, that snowpack, those wet, snowy winters, uh, we, we may not see fires, the uh, fire intensity that we would see in the drier seasons. 2015 had a lot of fires. Right, that's what I was looking at on your 2015s, yeah. Yeah, so you can really barely see across the lake, but I don't think we're really picking up that, that, that signal from those fires just because the hydrograph is so low. What I do think could potentially be happening in the southern part of the lake is, is those fires, the, uh, the, the, the huge amount of smoke from those fires might actually be reducing our cyanobacterial blooms because it, it's adding a nitrogen to the water column, and it's actually, we believe it's uh, shifting that N to P ratio in the uh, late summer when that would, uh, you know, uh, provide a lower N to P ratio for cyanobacterial type of blooms. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, James Elser. Hey, Dale. Um, I was uh, interested to see the data on metal contents in zooplankton from the lateral lakes. I'm wondering if there's similar data from like, you know, from Coeur d'Alene Lake for metal contents in zooplankton biomass, and is anyone looking at metal contents in fish? So yes, there is. Uh, I think it was uh, we we collected data in 2012 at three sites uh, in Coeur d'Alene Lake, and there there is some metals burden, zinc, and if I remember correctly, cadmium. Uh, I can definitely uh, uh, share that data with you. It's much, it's a much lower burden than what we find in the lateral lakes. Uh, Swan Lake is, is, is exceptionally high, uh, very hot. Uh, but yes, there is some data from that uh, from, from the main lake. 
And your second question, excuse me? Uh, yeah, are there similar data for fish, uh, both in the lateral lakes and in Lake Coeur d'Alene? Uh, yes, there is. There, there, was a, there was an updated fish consumption advisory report that came out just last year. And that data, if I remember correctly, was collected in 2017 or, or 18. So it is, it is very current data. So there is, there is metals, uh, metals in fish tissue uh, results also. And oh, one more thing. In the southern part of the system at C6, Round Lake, and Benoit Lake, we just, the tribe just started to collect um, uh, mercury samples. So we have some mercury data from 2020. Okay, I think we're down to the last couple of questions. Um, Robert Anir. Good morning, uh, Dale. Thanks for the presentation and thank you as well from the folks here at IBEQ. Um, has it, it looks like you've collected quite a bit of data from the lake itself, uh, and it looks like you've collected some data from the rivers. Has any attempts been made to draw any kind of relationship between? the seasonal trends that you're seeing in the lake and what kind of loading might be coming or concentrations are coming out of the rivers to St. Joe or the Port Lane? Uh, yes, I, I, I've been doing that. That's what I've been working on the last year, just looking at that potential uh, correlation between hydrograph intensity uh, and uh, loading, uh, especially from the St. Joe River on site C5. Given the high variability, there is actually a relationship. It, it's weak. But it, it, for instance, if I look at uh, loading intensity uh, and loads from, from the St. Joe River, there is, a, there, there is an effect on uh, chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, and if I believe so, there's also an effect on overall phytoplankton bio volume. But it is weak. Okay. Lynn Katz? Yeah, so um, I wanted to... Uh, actually follow up on that last question too about the loadings. Is is that been looked at for metals coming into the system as well or just um, nutrients? So um, yes, well, there, th th there has been loading. Um, I'm not sure if we've, we've really synthesized or, or, or looked at uh, the actual um, effects of the loading of metals, aside from the model, uh, loading of metals in the system. Uh, there are other folks that can, I think, uh, better answer that question. And maybe Lauren can answer that question better. We do know how much, for instance, we do know what, what uh, amount of metals that enter the system are retained in the system and how much, uh, you know, leave through the Spokane River. So we have estimates of that. There has been a lot of work done in the past. Good. And then can I just follow up with one yeah, more thing? Go ahead, go ahead. So what's the extent of the TOC and DOC data? I know it was just in a couple of years and it was in that, was it just in that special study? Uh, so we, no, no, we started in 2019 collecting it in the lower Coeur d'Alene River at site C5, at site C6, and, and in the lateral lake. So there's only two years worth of that data, but there is a time series of TOC and uh, DOC. Great, thanks. Okay, one last quick question, Laura Ehlers. You no, know, my question is not quick, so I'll defer to the Q&A at the end of the panel. Okay, great. All right, I think we're right about on time. Uh, so our third and last speaker in this session is uh, Lauren Zinzer of uh, US Geological Survey. She's a hydrologist, uh, has been working on uh, the river inputs. And so it's, it's, it's timely with those last few questions that we're relating the lake condition to the river. So Lauren, go ahead. Good morning. I think everybody can see and hear me all right. Yep. All right. So thanks for having me. Again, my name is Lauren Zinzer, and I'm a hydrologist with the US Geological Survey. I'll talk a bit about recent USGS data collection and trends in the Spokane River Basin. And as you'll see, the most recent USGS data really focuses on the rivers in the system rather than the lakes. So that's in contrast to the presentations we've heard already today. All right, so the USGS has done a lot of work in the basin over the years. Briefly, there were multiple special studies completed in the 1990s and 2000s. This includes limnology studies by woods, phosphorus, zinc, phytoplankton interactions by Kuwabera, metals, geochemistry, and bioavailability by Balistrieri, and tailings distributions by Fox. 
However, I'm not gonna talk about those today, so I'd refer, or refer you to the bibliography if you want more information about those particular studies. So mostly what I'll focus on here is the long-term data collection that the USGS does and the most recent trend analyses that are based on these data collections. The USGS collects measures discharge and collects water quality samples throughout the basin. Sampling consistency was fairly variable prior to the late 1990s. The sampling program became unified under the EPA's Basin Environmental Monitoring Program in 2004. The explicit purpose of the BEMP is long-term monitoring to evaluate remedy effectiveness associated with the Superfund site. So as you'll see then, most of the data associated with this program are concentrated in the Coeur d'Alene River Basin, um, and they are mostly focused on metals, although there is some nutrient data as well. These monitoring data really underpin the long-term data, the long-term trend analyses that I'll discuss a little bit later. So here's an overview. The USGS has many, many gauging stations throughout the Spokane River Basin. I'm highlighting only a few here that I think are especially important and give a sense of the length of the records available. The oldest gauges are up on the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene at Enaville up here, the Coeur d'Alene River at Cataldo here, and then the St. Joe River at, um, sorry, the St. Joe River at Calder. And those came online about 1911. In the late 1980s, additional monitoring stations came online in the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River associated with the Superfund site. The most recent or gauges that came online are those associated with the mouth of the Coeur d'Alene River and the mouth of the St. Joe River and the outlet to the lake at the Spokane River. And that's because those sites are affected by backwater conditions and that makes um, measuring discharge a little bit tricky. So a little bit more on discharge data. The USGS gauging stations do not directly measure discharge. Instead, they generally measure stage or velocity. These parameters are related to discharge by periodic discharge measurements taken on site by a technician. And then these relationships are used to develop rating curves to correlate stage or velocity to discharge. Most of the gauges in the basin are stage gauges, but the backwater affected sites are index velocity gauges that use acoustic Doppler veloci velocity meters or ADVMs. The USGS started using these in the early 2000s and ADVM gauges were installed shortly thereafter in this Coeur d'Alene River near Harrison, St. Joe River at Ramsdale, and the Spokane River at the Lake Outlet. Similar to discharge, this is by no means a comprehensive list of all the sites in the basin that have water quality data. Instead, I've highlighted some of the most important water quality sites, at least in my opinion. And in particular, these are the ones that I used for the trend analysis that I'll discuss later. Some of these sites have water quality data dating back all the way to 1971, but the year noted here is the year in which sampling became sufficiently regular that I was comfortable including it in data analyses or in trend analyses rather. The longest well sampled periods be began around 1990 and are associated with characterizing the Superfund site and si sites continued to be added where more definition was needed thereafter. The data, water quality data and the discharge data are all available on, on our website and West, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Samples are collected using standardized sample collection methods. Sample, samples are isokinetic. That means that the concentration of sediment, for example, or a constituent in the water is the same flowing into the sampling nozzle as it is in the water flowing around the sampling nozzle. So the effect of this effectively is that the sampler itself does not bias the sample. Samples are also width and depth integrated. The right diagram shows this. The sampler is lowered through the water column at the same rate and equally spaced intervals. This results in the sample collected being proportional to the discharge in each interval. This is important because constituents are not necessarily evenly distributed through the water column. So this sampling method accurately represents the total mass of the constituent across the full river cross section. Here you see the bridge crane and sampling device. The bridge crane lowers and raises the sampling device through an increment and then is advanced across the bridge to the next increment. The technician empties the sampling device into the churn splitter, which is shown in the back here in the blue bin. Um, each time it fills, the churn splitter is then taken into the mobile sampling lab where whole water samples are, are distributed into bottles in a homogeneous way. And then processing for filtered samples takes place in a chamber, which isolates the sample from airborne contaminants. Analytes measured in this basin have varied over time, but they currently include totaled and filtered metals including arsenic, cadmium, copper, iron, lead, manganese, and zinc. 
There are a variety of totaled and filtered nutrients. This includes total phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, orthophosphate, total nitrogen, organic nitrogen, nitrate plus nitrite, and ammonia. Major cations measured are calcium and magnesium, and that's so that we can calculate hardness and suspended sediment concentration. So these long-term discharge and water quality data are really the foundation for all the subsequent trend analyses. The USGS has published multiple analyses over time, which have also clearly established the patterns of metal transport. Some of the speakers on Wednesday touched upon this, but I wanna give you a quick reminder of, of how metals move through the system. Most of the cadmium and zinc in the system is dissolved and the zinc trends are generally a pretty good proxy for the cadmium trends. Most of the lead in the system is particulate. High flows transport the biggest loads of all constituents. The highest total lead and phosphorus concentrations also occur during high flows and the highest dissolved zinc and cadmium concentrations generally occur during low flows. With metals transport fairly well understood in the basin, the most recent trend analysis focused on trace metals and nutrients in covered water years 1990 through 2018. The main research question was fairly simple. How are concentrations and loads changing over time? The report covers multiple constituents, but I'm only talking about dissolved lead total, or sorry, dissolved zinc total lead and total phosphorus in this presentation. To understand changes in concentrations and loads over time, I used a statistical approach called weighted regressions on time, discharge, and season. WRTDS is a highly flexible regression approach that uses the relationships between concentration, time, discharge, and season to estimate concentrations each day during the study period. These estimates can then be used to estimate flow normalized annual mean concentrations and annual total loads. Flow normalization, in effect, estimates what concentrations and loads would have been for a given year if the hydrologic conditions had been average. As we know, loading concentrations scale with discharge, so this particular approach is best for trend detection because it smooths out some of the year-to-year -year variability associated with high or low water years. I also use WRTDS with Kelman filtering to estimate annual mean concentrations and annual total loads. This approach provides the best estimate of actual annual conditions because this model is forced to respect the sampled concentrations on sample days. And finally, I used a bootstrap model or bootstrap approach, pardon me, to model concentrations many times over in order to construct confidence intervals around the trends. These data are then used to describe the statistical likelihood of the trend direction. I should note here that all these statistical approach approaches were developed by our moderator here today, Bob. So jumping right into the trends results, I'll take a moment to orient you to the graphs because these graphs will show up again and again over the next couple of slides. The vertical axis shows dissolved concentration in micrograms per liter on the right hand side and dissolved dissolved zinc load in metric tons per year on the right hand side. The horizontal axis shows the water year Black dots are WRTDSK annual mean concentrations and annual total loads. Green and blue lines are WRTDS flow normalized annual mean concentrations and annual total loads. I have just three key sites shown here. It's the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River near Pinehurst at the top, which of course represents the contribution from all of the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River. The Coeur d'Alene River near Harrison, which represents inflow to the lake. Spokane River below the lake out, outlet, which represents flow out of the lake. As you can see, the decreasing trends are striking in both concentration and load in the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River near Pinehurst. Decreasing trends are also strong and striking as you move downstream in the system through Coeur d'Alene Lake and even in Spokane River below the lake. And although the absolute constant, although as you can see, the absolute concentrations get lower as you move down through the system, at least at the Spokane River, um, and the, the loads also vary as well. Also the period of record changes and that's sort of an important thing to note that these data records are not the same in length. Overall at these three sites, dissolved zinc concentrations and loads decreased 35 to 65% over the period of record. So what level of statistical confidence do we have in these trends? Here I'm showing the results of the bootstrapped models represented in plain language. So if, for example, the trend was down in 85 or more models out of 100, then the trend was considered likely down. And that's shown by that dark blue downward pointing arrow. If the trends were down in 70 to 84 out of 100 models, the trend was considered somewhat likely down. And those are shown by the unfilled blue arrow, down arrow. So here I'm showing the statistical confidence um, for all of the sites that I, that I 
did trend analysis for, not just the three. Um, we have concentration on the left-hand side and load on the right-hand side, the trends over the entire period of record available for each given site across the top, and then the, the trend over the 2009 through 2018 period on the bottom. And so what you see here is that for dissolved zinc concentrations and loads, decreases were statistically likely at the mining affected area over both periods of study, although the magnitude of the change was somewhat smaller in the most recent, recent decade. So here we have the same graphs, but this time showing total lead concentrations and loads. As you can see, concentrations and loads were strikingly down over the period of record in the South Fork Cordelline near Pinehurst and somewhat down in the Spokane River. In contrast, lead loads were actually up a bit in the Coeur d'Alene River near Harrison. So overall, lead concentrations and loads decreased 25 to 75% over the period of record at these three sites, except for at Harrison where loads actually went up slightly by about 25%. So looking now at the statistical confidence in the, in the lead trends for all the sites across, across the, the basin that were analyzed, Total lead concentration and load decreases were statistically likely for most mining affected sites during both periods studied. However, the total lead load in Coeur d'Alene River near Harrison had a somewhat likely increase over the period of record and somewhat likely decreases, and decreases were only somewhat likely in 2009 through 2018. So though the Harrison lead results are really quite different than the zinc trends and the, the, some of the lead trends at the other sites, these, these results are in line with what we expect giving metal sources transport and remediation in the basin. So just as a quick reminder, as I mentioned earlier, previous research has shown that most of the dissolved zinc in the system comes from the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River and tributaries. Most of the remediation to date has also taken place in this part of the basin. In contrast, most of the total lead comes from the main stem Coeur d'Alene River and relatively little remediation has taken place in this area so far. So the metal trends that we're seeing, although they're somewhat different for zinc and lead, especially at Harrison, are consistent with how metals move through the system and what we know about metals remediation in the system so far. This really stands in contrast to total phosphorus because the total phosphorus trends look quite different. So total phosphorus concentrations and loads actually went up in the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River between 1990 to about 2000, and then they leveled off and then actually go down slightly in the most recent decade. This is also true for loads in the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River near Pinehurst. The shape of the trend is quite similar at Harrison, although the, the magnitude is somewhat different and the timing is somewhat different. But again, we see that concentrations and loads go up somewhat, they flatten off in the, in the 2000s and then they are actually declining slightly in the most recent year. Although not shown, the trends for the North Fork Coeur d'Alene River are fairly similar to those that are shown here for the Coeur d'Alene River near Harrison. And the concentrations in the Spokane River below the lake outlet actually go down somewhat for total phosphorus concentration and loads are down a little bit, but more or less down a little bit. The other thing that's really important to note here, though, is that there's a really big difference in record length, and that hampers the comparison. So consistent to total phosphorus data go back to about 1990 for Pinehurst, but only back to 1999 for Harrison and 2003 for Spokane River. And so that makes comparisons between these data sets really, really a little bit tricky. So looking again at all the sites across the entire basin, we see primarily here that the variables are, are the, the trends are variable spatially and temporally. Some sites have uptrends, some sites have downtrends, some sites have no clear trends, which are shown by the gray dots, and some trends and some sites have insufficient data to model. And so, so in order to try, try to, or again, the variable record lengths make the site-to-site -site comparison a little bit tricky for these constituents, and it especially confounds the total phosphorus interpretation because those lengths vary so much. So I looked at these data a little bit differently. For this reason, it helps to look at these trends using standardized time intervals, but the trade-off here is that we're not looking at the period of the most dramatic increases, which is the 1990s, because there's really only one site for which we have data on that. So here, the slope of the load trend is expressed as a percent per year on the vertical axis. The sites are shown across the bottom. 2002 to 2009 are shown in yellow. 2009 to 2018 are in blue. The dot represents the median. Bars represent the 90% confidence intervals. So as you can see, for the North Fork, or sorry, pardon me, for the South Fork Coeur River, 
near Pinehurst, the North Fork Coeur d'Alene River and the Coeur d'Alene River near Harrison, you have similar patterns of, and actually for Milterville as well, you have similar patterns of increasing in 2002, 2009, and then you have decreases in 2009 to 2018. Smelterville is a little bit more ambiguous. It's hard to say which way that is trending in the most recent time period. For the other two sites that had enough data to do this analysis, Canyon Creek and South Fork Coeur d'Alene at Elizabeth Park, the trend direction is really ambiguous for both of those time periods. So suffice to say that there's a lot of variability in the sites and in the time periods of the trends. And what does this mean? Well, here, honestly, we're faced with the limits of a trend analysis. Trend analysis is really good at showing what happened, but it's much more limited in how we can interpret what, what it means. So for the metals, we have a really solid conceptual model and, and a good understanding of the site remedian, remediation history. And those bits of information that are external to the trend analysis are fully congruent with the trends we see. So I'm a little bit more confident in describing what's happening. Unfortunately, we have much less phosphorus data and much less of an understanding of phosphorus loading, transport, and transformation in this particular system. So to me, this really points to a key unresolved question, which is what mechanism or mechanisms increase is, is po can possibly have increased phosphorus drastically in the late 1990s, increased phosphorus less so in the 2000s, and then in fact decreased phosphorus somewhat in the 2010s, because that's really a little bit of an odd trend. So in summary, real quick here, um, conclusions from this most recent trend analysis, decreases in dissolved zinc and total lead concentrations and loads at most sites are large, statistically likely, and consistent with conceptual models of metal transport and timing of remediation activities. Somewhat likely increases in lead loads in the Coeur d'Alene River near Harrison are consistent with the conceptual models for lead transport and limited main stem Coeur d'Alene River remediation. Phosphorus trends are highly variable across the Spokane River, both in space and in time, and are based on limited data and lack a clear conceptual model for sources and transport. So again, to me, the key remaining question is really what is driving phosphorus trends in the Spokane River Basin? And I think there should be plenty of time for questions. All right, we'll take questions. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, James Moberly. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, I, I saw the, the data for phosphorus and, and you, you mentioned uh, for, for lead, zinc, cadmium. Uh, do you have also uh, data for arsenic and, and some of the other redox metals in the system? There is data for arsenic, copper. I think those are probably two manganese, iron, but I did not do trend analyses on those just because you only have so much time. But yeah, there's sure. for those, those constituents available. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sam Lawoma. Hi, Lauren. Nice presentation, very nice. Um, how does total zinc, have you, have you analyzed trends in total zinc? I mean, that's comparable to total lead because of course suspended sediment concentrations are involved in the totals. So how does total zinc compare to dissolved zinc in terms of concentration, in terms of trends in it? Yeah, good question. And so for, for mo the vast majority of the zinc and cadmium both present in the system are actually present in that filtered fraction, that less than 0.45 micrograms. There is a little bit of a particulate component to zinc and cadmium both, and the transport for the particulate component is more comparable to lead. And so those are, those are constituents that you see occurring most um, prominently during high flow events, and particularly in the lower basin, they tend to pop up at a little bit higher concentrations. But overall, because most of the signal for the, the zinc and the cadmium is dominated by the dissolved, the overall trends track pretty closely with mm. the dissolved trends. When you say most of it, does that mean that constantly? Okay, that, that, that explains. One, if I could ask one additional question, just a minor one. I must have missed it. Uh, and this has to do with the, the value of absolute loads instead of trends, but do you, does, the, does the sampling concentrate at all on first flush to get uh, loads or is it kind of regular? I mean, how, how is the sampling? I probably missed that, but anyway. No, you didn't miss it. I, I missed it. Thank you. So thank you for bringing it up. We've tended to concentrate the sampling associated with the BEMP uh, for high flow loads because, or high flow events because that is where most of the loads are. So we try very hard to get winter flooding events, which can be really, really significant. The biggest, biggest transport events and the biggest floods have been rain on snow events historically. So if there's a rain on snow event, we always try to get those. Um, we also try to get the peak of the hydrograph, which on any given year is 
often the biggest loading event. We also get a re the receiving limb of the hydrograph and then we get a base flow sample. So over time, our, our sampling, and that's, I should say too, that's that's for about the last 10 years or so that we've, we've sampled in that way. The sampling strategy has varied over time. We've had different programs with slightly different goals, but generally we've focused more on high flow events than on low flow events. Great, thank you. But if I could just follow up with that. So about how many samples might you get in a year at some of your major sites? So currently we get four samples per year at the major sites. Over time, that's probably varied between about two to eight samples per year, depending on the specific program. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bill Arnold. Hello, Ryan. I, I like this data set a lot. I was just curious, especially with regards to the, the changing process over time, is do you or does someone else have data on the changes in land use in these watersheds over the period where you've been collecting data? So I think honestly, the person who's done the most thinking and the most data analysis on that is Craig Cooper, who you heard from in the last or the last couple of presentations. He did did a nutrient um, inventory analysis that was really quite extensive, and he looked at some of those land change and other things that could have potentially been in, impacting phosphorus loads with a little bit more detail than I was able to. Do you want to follow up on that, uh, William, Bill? If there's time, that'd be great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we did use satellite data um, to look at changes in land use, including changes in forest cover. And there are some su significant changes in land use in some focused areas of the basin, but a broad, large scale, it's very comparable over the decades. And we can simply go into that more later if you wish. Oh, thank you. And, and if I could follow up somewhat along a similar line, uh, really to all the panelists, and that's a, a question about, so there's a number of really small tributaries that, that drain the areas close to the lake, and I gather that some of them are areas that have seen a lot of uh, population growth in recent years, as well as a fair amount of agricultural activities. Does anybody really have long-term water quality records on some of these smaller tributaries that are quite close to the lake? Um, that is a huge data gap, uh, Bob, and we're working on getting that now and the study started in 2018. For our inventory, we really had to resort to sparrow modeling, which didn't show that type of distribution. And it is a big question that we're addressing, but we also kind of tried to get at in the lake effects with our pair fighting study. Right. We can go into that much more detail later as you wish. Yeah. I can add to that. Uh, we, yeah, we can supply some information on uh, some of the um, nutrient uh, work that we that we did in the early 2000s, uh, several years we did, uh, I think it was four or five streams uh, on the tribal uh, side that that have that we have data for. And were those? So is there sufficient information to it to, to try to compute a load, uh, at least for the years that were sampled? In other words, is there discharge data to go along with that water quality sampling data? Yes, there is. Yes, there is uh, estimated uh, daily uh, numbers for those streams. Right. Yeah. And on our current study, we're getting uh, very detailed uh, discharge as well as phosphorus data. And I think we now this year have enough to start calculating loads for the 12 tributaries we're working at right now. Okay. Uh, I see Laura has her hand up. Laura Ehlers. I was, uh, by the way, I think we should open up questions to all the panelists now um, before our break happens. Um, I, I'm trying to kind of get my hands around the whole sampling enterprise. And it seems to me like what I heard was that IDEQ is in the northern part of the lake, north of the, uh, the confluence with the Coeur d'Alene River. The tribe is certainly monitoring the southern part of the lake, but also seems to be monitoring the Coeur d'Alene River, which is not technically part of the reservation, correct? Um, yeah. And also monitoring the St. Joe River. And then the USGS is really strictly limited to the Coeur d'Alene River and its tributaries. Is that is that correct? So there's um, not the US the USGS also also samples in the St. Joe River Basin and in the Spokane River, and so really we're move, we're working on the major the major systems into and out of the lake, but none in the lake itself, not lake presently. But but if I could, Laura, uh, historically, there's a good deal of USGS work in the lake, 
um, in the lake sediments, um, but that's um, 30 or more years ago. Correct. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. I just, for purposes of requesting data, which I'm sure the committee will do, we just wanna make sure that we're asking all the right people, depending on, on what it is. And, and then um, we just got Bob to illuminate some gaps, which are perhaps data on the small tributaries coming into the lake. I'm wondering if the three panelists could comment on what they perceive to be data gaps that they would like to fill if they had more resources. Um, well, from a DEQ perspective, we're focusing on two data gaps. Uh, one is that tributaries uh, information. It's a really huge gap and it's a big effort to get that. Um, we're also, there's a data gap in what the winter uh, looks like on the lake in January and February. Because often when we get out there in March or April, we do see increasing chlorophyll A with depth showing there may have been a large bloom, but we don't have data on that. So those are two major data gaps. Um, and that we're focusing on the most. So, uh, yeah, I can add. So I think one of the big data gaps we have is we, we, we're, we're kind of heavy on, on total loads, total loading into the system, into the lake. I don't think we have a really good idea of how much of that total load in particular form is moving uh, through the lake and then, or, or ending up in sediments. So I think, uh, you know, some Seston trap uh, data would be really good to begin to parse out that uh, particulate uh, form. And from a modeling perspective, we have, you know, we have these, we have this uh, photic zone composite, which is really kind of fuzzy. We need more discrete uh, depth grabs for chlorophyll, for nutrients, for metals. And that, that would help a lot with the modeling uh, component of it, which I'll talk about later. Yeah. Um, I should also add that there's a gap on tying the river, the Corvette River to the lake. It would be very good to get a more, a better data set um, that has more sampling frequency and covers things like conductivity at the Harrison site oh, for the USGS, and also some more data in that area where the Corvette River comes into the lake. Lauren, did you want to add anything? I think from my perspective for, for long-term analyses, more frequency is always nice. So if you can get it up to more times per year, and if you, especially um, as we start to all think about the, the low flow dynamics, I think historically that's a little bit underrepresented in the, in the USGS data. So I think those are two places that would be nice. I think the lower basin, the lower Coeur d'Alene or the main stem Coeur d'Alene River in general, it would be nice to have better spatial coverage on that part of the river because it's a really complicated system. Um, and I think it's quite possible that the, a lot of the phosphorus transformations and loadings are, are, are tied to that part of the basin and we just don't have great special, spatial or temporal coverage of that part of the system. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. That's from Scott Fendorf. Yeah, this is a, a, a general question, um, mostly towards Lauren. You, you mentioned um, a study from Lori Balistrieri uh, on the the poor water, interstitial poor waters. Is anybody else monitoring that? I mean, that was back um, done in 92, the report's 98, but all the data seems to support that there's benthic fluxes coming out. And my curiosity is if we want to understand, well, my take is that if we really want to understand the fluxes coming out, we need to understand the diagenic processes and the sediments that are, that are happening. And, we could follow up on specific, but the redox active elements going from anywhere from iron and sulfur to to the follow on and what's that's doing to lead and cadmium and arsenic. Um, anyway, so the question is, is, is there anybody tracking pore water data in the sediments? I think the short answer is no, not since Lori did her work, Balistrieri, Balistrieri did her work, though the EPA is doing a little bit of limited research into this or planning to do a little bit of limited research in this in some of the wetland areas in this coming year. But basically it's been a, a really important but relatively understudied area as far as I understand and, and possibly Dale or Craig might have other insights into this, but I, I don't know of other data sets that are specifically looking at poor water. Craig? We yeah, we haven't studied ourselves at DEQ, but there was a recent years of Idaho study where they did some core incubations and looked at fluxes in the pore water, as I understand it. Yeah, I'd like to also, oh, I'd like to also add, uh, I think we need to 
we need to take a subset of what uh, Horowitz did back in the 90s and, and, and look at those and look at the sediment concentrations again, because I think there is significant benthic flux, especially with, with zinc. And I think that, that would uh, begin to uh, help us understand uh, what those changes have been in the sediments. If I could just, and I'll make this the last part, it's just, and it's more a comment than anything. It, looking at the profoundly decreasing trends in the metals that Lauren showed us in the rivers, one would think that the that a core of sediment from the lake would would show that history from extremely high deposition rates of the metals to to sediment that's much cleaner, still not clean, but much cleaner. But is there any coring work that would describe sort of the hist history in out in the lake or the lower rivers? Um, there hasn't been any since the Horowitz studies uh, in the 1990s. Right. We're not set up to do that. Yeah. It would be great to get that data. <laughs> yeah. okay. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, this has been an excellent uh, presentation. I thank all of our speakers for crisp and on-time uh, presentations. And uh, um, we have a half-hour break. Laura Ehlers, did you want to, uh, or Sam, did you have anything to say before we go to break? Uh, uh, Laura, my schedule says a 15 minute break. You got a half oh, hour. It? I'm sorry. Break. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. 15. Okay. Uh, so let's see everybody back then at, uh, depending upon your time zone, that'd be 1045 uh, in the Coeur d'Alene time zone. Uh, 940. I'm sorry. Yeah. 945 here in the West Coast. And I won't translate the rest of them. Right. Okay. <laughs> see you in 15 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome everybody back. Welcome back everybody, sorry. Uh, we're gonna go, go on now to our, move on to our uh, second half of the panel discussion. In this case, the discussion of water quality models and this will be moderated by Jeff Slatow. Okay, uh, thanks Sam uh, and good morning and good afternoon everybody. Uh, so in the uh, water quality model panel discussion. We have four presenters. So uh, without trying to take up any of their time, let me introduce the first one. And that'll be um, Craig Cooper from IDEQ. So Craig. Take a moment to talk about the lake's conceptual model and its key components. The first is that geography and bathymetry create four distinct physical and biogeochemical regions. These being the southern pool, the Coyne River mixing zone, the central pool, and the northern pool. Regional climate is snow dominated, that generates a highly variable hydrology, and also responds to ENSO cycles. River hydrology is the dominant physical and biogeochemical control in the lake. Other factors are also important, such as diurnal wind fields, smaller tributaries, and winter precipitation, as well as summer evaporation rates. The lake has a strong seasonality. We also know that metals inhibit lake productivity. Now, from the sediment perspective, an oxic hypolimnium traps sediment metals under an iron oxide cap. That cap can break down if the overlying waters in the hypolimnium become hypoxic. That means we do not need to get to zero oxygen before metals come out of the sediments. We can maintain an oxic hypolimnium with sufficient nutrient control face a long-term challenge of how do we maintain that sufficient nutrient control. Let's talk a moment now about hydrology and seasonality. Now we've previously talked about how the Coeur d'Alene and St. Joe rivers go through a strong seasonal hydrologic cycle that's dominated by snow runoff. And the combination of those two rivers into the lake creates a very strong seasonality in the lake's hydraulic residence time. Now this box plot is based on AEM 3D model predictions provided to DEQ by Dr. Michael Anderson, Professor Emeritus at UC Riverside. And a key feature of this is that during peak runoff months, the average residence time is about 90 days. It can be as short as 30 days during high flow years. This means that the lake doesn't work like a conveyor belt, a continuous system. 
Rather, it gets a big pulse that can fill the entire lake inside of three months, and then it cooks the rest of the year and then pulses again, kind of like a heartbeat. Pulse, rest, pulse, rest. We can also break the lake into five hydrologic seasons, those being early spring with our shortest residence times, increasing through late spring to our longest residence times during summer, decreasing during fall turnover when we also have drawdown for the post fall dam. To winter time, we start to get our winter snows, again, then reaching our fastest residence time again during spring runoff. Let's talk a little bit about the conceptual mixing model and atmospheric influences. Now, the southern pool was primarily influenced by the St. Joe River water flowing northward. It then encounters water from the Coeur d'Alene River and doesn't really fully mix until it gets well into the central pool. Coeur d'Alene River water can also dive down and flow southwards to some extent. As we move to the central pool, sediments rain out and the waters from these rivers more fully mix. As we get to the northern pool, there's a hydraulic pull from the Spokane River outlet and also a push from the smaller tributaries here on the eastern side of the lake, creating a different hydrodynamics in the northern pool than you get in the central pool. You also have a large influence from these tributaries in this part of the lake. Now, the lake also has a diurnal wind cycle that is distinct throughout the year, which can create standing internal waves. We also have an important influence of precipitation, which falls predominantly as snow during the spring months, and we get earlier runoff from the smaller tributaries. And this brings us to the lake's biogeochemical concepts, where low loading of nutrients in the runoff leads to oligotrophic surface waters, which leads to a lower carbon rain to the hypolimnion and maintains an oxic state that protects the iron oxide cap in the sediments that keeps the metals trapped in there. We want to maintain that cap. And with this, that covers the core parts of the conceptual model, and I'll pass it on to Dale. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dale, are you uh, ready to continue? Yes, I think so. I'm going to try to start this correctly this time. Okay. Can can people see the slide? No. No. Okay. Okay, how about now? No. Uh, no again. So Dale, in, in Zoom, you have to click on your green share screen button. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not sure why it's not. Okay. Yep, okay. Okay, how about now? No, it's very good. Okay, finally. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about is the AEM 3D model uh, that we've applied to Cordling Lake. And just a little background. So AEM 3D uh, is an improved version of uh, LCOM CATEM. Uh, those improvements are uh, now the model runs under multiple processors. The, uh, the CATEM, the biology and chemistry a submodel time step is now separated from the physics time step, and the uh, HydroHub software that comes with the model is uh, is uh, much improved, especially for visualization. What we've done is uh, we've actually used a lot of um, a lot of R scripts. We've developed R scripts that take the raw uh, .nc files and produce figures and metrics well, with those scripts, which the panel can definitely have. Um, so initially, when, we, when I first started running the model, for a, for a one-year simulation on Coeur d'Alene Lake, it was taking about, with one core, taking about 137 hours to run. Uh, now we're at six and a half hours, so we went from days to hours. Uh, 
We, we also have done a little bit of estimates of just on, on the right-hand side, this right-hand figure, the, um, the number of cores or number of threads and the efficiency of the model. So we're trying to dial in just how efficient we can be in actually running the model, which, which has improved dramatically over time. Let's see here. Okay, so the data that I'm gonna show you here uh, later in the talk is from this simulation. I'll move through this fairly fast. Uh, this is the 2014 calibration year, started in, uh, starts in March and it ends in December. Uh, the grid for the lake is a 250 by 250 meter bathymetry grid. The upper 20 meters are at uh, 0.5 meter increments and the lower, uh, deeper part of the lake is at a one meter increment. Time step of 240 seconds. The East Point weather station with five minute resolution is the only weather station we've used uh, for, this, for these runs. Uh, the daily concentration is estimated from river loading estimates from the WRTDS uh, USGS WRTDS uh, model, which Lauren spoke of earlier. Uh, we have initial conditions at C1, C4, C5, and C6. A static sediment model, four phytoplankton groups, the uh, organic metal cycling to the phytoplankton, and uh, Kuobara's equations are in, are in the CATEM component of this for zinc toxicity function for phytoplankton. For these runs, uh, we have no zooplankton groups. However, we do have zooplankton data and I have calibrated with zooplankton also. Uh, standard boundary conditions, uh, meteorology, uh, river loading. The model requires uh, inorganic forms of nutrients. Uh, we have PLC and DOC and transition metals associated with that, with those loadings. So for this talk, what I'm gonna focus on are uh, are the variables uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll A, and zinc. We're also working on uh, iron, manganese, phosphate, nitrate, and ammonia, but we haven't calibrated yet. We haven't done much with those. Um, my philosophy is uh, don't over-parameterize and take small bites, uh, literature values or our own measurements. Uh, I don't try to tweak the model too far beyond what I can find in the literature or what we've actually measured. We initially started with Kuwabara's sediment flux estimates. Uh, that's table eight for SOD, and I think it's table nine for the, uh, the uh, metals and the nutrient flux from the sediments. That was from Kuwabara et al., uh, their lander uh, estimates of sediment flux. So like I said before, the model output, it produces net CDF files. Uh, we, you, we use the profiles component of that for, uh, for this talk for C1, C4, and C5 specifically. As I said before, uh, I didn't develop it. Uh, ben Schofield of our staff, who is a guru at R, has uh, developed uh, these R scripts that take those raw NC files and uh, produce metrics and, uh, and our, our own trend series to compare observed versus uh, modeled uh, output. Just on the right-hand side, these figures just show some of the model sensitivity that, uh, I'm just trying to show that yes, it is highly sensitive to changes in sediment oxygen demand parameters. And uh, the zinc flux itself um, is, is very sensitive also to those changes in, in, in sediment oxygen demand. Right to the results here. So uh, what this shows is uh, the uh, root mean square error of temperature uh, predicted by the model on the uh, y-axis versus the observed temperature on the x-axis. The colored circles are the different dates uh, where we had observed versus modeled. And uh, uh, we have uh, C, C1, C4, and C5 sites that uh, we've done this analysis on. Just looking at the literature, these seem to be in the ballpark, C5 is, is kind of a trouble child because it mixes so much, it has so much wind energy that affects it at times and it's shallow. Uh, but uh, overall, these are, I think these are decent, decent R, um, RMSEs for temperature. Uh, an example of temperature at depth. So this is temperature in the hypolimnion. Here at C1, 30 meters. Uh, modeled line versus the measured. C4 at 35 meters. Once again, model line versus measured, and uh, C5 at 17 meters 
the uh, model versus measure. I tried to expand the y, uh, the scale on the y-axis as far as I could to, to show the spread and show the dynamic. Uh, here's the uh, epilimnian temperatures. Once again, I'd like to get some perspective from the panel. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find in the literature, you know, what what are good results versus poor results for model predictability. Uh, now I'm going to move on to dissolved oxygen. Once again, C1, C4, and C5. This is in the south, central, and north basin. RMSE at C4 of 0.91. C4 tends to be the best for temperature and dissolved oxygen. Of course, it's the closest to the uh, weather station also. Dissolved oxygen in the hypolimnion at C1, again, 30 meters. You can see the bias, the offset here, but it does follow the uh, uh, a general trend the model does. C4, 35 meters, tighter, and uh, C5 at 17 meters, uh, pretty tight. Uh, this is dissolved zinc, so calibration results for dissolved zinc. Of course, we have fewer, fewer observed versus uh, measured uh, comparisons because these are these are chemistries. Uh, the triangle is the bottom or the hypolimnion, and the circles are the epilimnion. So you can see an RMSE at C1, 7.56. Uh, Craig can maybe give an average later of what, what zinc is there, but it's probably around, I guess, 60, maybe something like that. Dissolved zinc predicted in the hypolimnion at C1, C4, and C7. I'm moving kind of fast, but I want to get through this for you. Uh, chlorophyll, low sample size, like I said before, we need to have more discrete grabs at uh, discrete depths to improve our, our, our measured chlorophyll A estimates. Uh, and very quickly, next steps is I'm, I'm going to focus on iron, manganese, phosphate, nitrate, and ammonia. And uh, I think we can, we know we can improve the model because we, we've done temperature uh, simulations and chemistry simulations at the 100 by 100 meter grid, uh, which of course increases computation time, but it, it, that definitely improves the model. Uh, I'm looking to do a 50 by 50 meter grid and uh, a mid lake buoy with weather and thermistor uh, you know, DO chain would be an optimal boundary condition, I think, uh, or a couple of those, one in the north, one in the south, potentially. Um, we need to improve our, our synoptics, like our, our lake-wide synoptics that, like I said, uh, well, once again, gives us multiple grabs per site, gives us better spatial temporal uh, measurements to compare uh, for the model and, and uh, help calibrate the model. With that, I will end. Okay, um, thank you. So may, maybe now would be a good time to uh, to stop and open it up to some questions. Uh, Robin here, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, uh, Dale. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Fred. So, a couple. I have a bunch of questions. So, uh, Jeff, definitely stop me if I go too long here. So, Dale, could you speak a little bit about the water budget, like how well that was calibrated? Okay, so. This is this has been kind of a kind of a problem issue. I've actually I've actually had to go into the water budget and manually uh, alter the outflow of the Spokane River and uh, for the water budget so it so it does fit. It is very tight, but it's a it's a time consuming process. I've tried to work on a, a dynamic boundary condition that that adjusts the water to uh, lake level uh, to to get a more uh, precise water budget with that boundary condition. I haven't succeeded. Um, I need some. I need some assistance with that, <laughs> essentially. Um, so, um, oh, follow yeah. the challenge. <laughs> mm, yes. Um, have you used something like conductivity data or other like velocity data to sort of calibrate the hydrodynamics within the lake itself to get the mixing? 
No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't really got that far in that. We have done some tracers. We've, we've released some tracers. That, that, that's one of the powerful components of this model is that you can release tracers and, uh, and, then, and then model those tracers. So that's, that's kind of a next step from the standpoint of a temperature, especially with temperature, uh, which we've done a fair amount of work with, actually. Uh, the last question for the moment is how how is the the model? I've not had a chance to dig into reports on the model yet, but how is light penetration handled in in the model? So it it, it does it does model um, the uh, PAR does and so uh, it, it also has of course um, the uh, fraction of, of of different wavelengths of, of uh, PAR versus the uh, I guess the short short wave radiation, um, and it does. Uh, I think I haven't done it, I haven't used it yet, but it does uh, you know model attenuation coefficients. Okay. I, I thought of one more if I may. Uh, mm -hmm. Simply effective wind. I know you were talking about having a met station on the lake itself and a buoy. So have you are you able to make adjustments to the meteorology data that you do have now that may be measured off the lake to have it be more reflective of what's on the lake. The, well, there is a potential for that. I really haven't, I haven't had the time to really delve into that. What I have done is I've tried to use the Shingle Bay, which is the, which is the, the, the weather station closest to C5. I, I've tried to use that data and I've tried to change the wind field between East Point and C5 to see if I can I can duplicate or replicate what's happening. Uh, Coeur d'Alene is, is that southern part of Coeur d'Alene Lake is highly dynamic with wind, and uh, there's there's wind fronts that that are moving all around the lake. It's kind of in a little canyony area, so it's very difficult. But I have tried to change those 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 wind zones, and it really hasn't affected the model. In fact, the East Point using the East Point Weather Station gives us the best temperature RMSE and bias of of, of all the weather stations. Thank you. Um, let, let, let me, actually, I'll let, I'll let Priya um, ask her questions first. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, I have a couple, one of them is a very broad question. I was wondering, uh, one of the speakers from the county on Wednesday talked about development along the, um, the lake shoreline, and I was wondering if, if there's a kind of a sense of how quickly that's going to happen and how that may change the dynamics of the lake. And then the second question was, um, we were talking about sediment cores and that only they were taken, I guess, earlier than the 1990s. But have there been enough bathymetric surveys to get a sense of areas of deposition versus scouring within the lake? Um. Well, I guess to answer your question on projections of development around the lake, it's exploding. Um, we're one of the fast developing counties in the whole Pacific Northwest. And you're always seeing homes go up at an explosive rate in the summertime and roads going in. So that's a concern of how that may affect both uh, the particle deposition on the lake and near shore loading. Um, but I don't have any future projection models of that. Does that answer your question on that for you? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, and the bathymetry, um, Dale, we've got some, but do you know how good it is for your model? Well, the bathymetry, the bathymetry itself was was is is actually pretty high resolution. I I guess I I, I may maybe I, I don't understand your your question, Priya, with regards to the. Are you, are you talking about the hydrodynamics in the deeper basins, uh, oh. just river influence, those types of things? Um, I guess getting a sense of like I've in other studies I've seen uh, bathymetric maps, a series of them used um, over years to kind of get a sense of where are depositional areas within the system versus um, areas of erosion. Since we don't have extensive core data, just wondering if that information is available. I I don't believe that information is available. I, I've never seen that. Uh, sorry, uh, Jim, why don't you go ahead? Okay, hi, Dale. I just wanted to ask, so the model's running off of uh, phosphate uh, 
uh, supply and driving the uh, phytoplankton pool, but if uh, a lot of the phosphorus loading is coming in particulate form, how is the model going to uh, accommodate that? As far as I understand, the, the, the model only uses phosphate loading. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't use that that particulate form. Uh, as far as I understand, the, the particulate form itself is is part of the total phosphorus. That's that's a derived variable in the model. Um, is that does that help? But a lot of that particulate phosphorus might become bioavailable, um, and you know, supply phytoplankton production. Yeah, correct. So um, from from all the examples I've seen of the model use, it, it has only uh, used or actually responded to, to to phosphate introduction, phosphate loading. So, but there are components okay. within the model that take that. There there are you know mineralization components of the model uh, rates that, that that can be changed. The model itself has a lot of knobs and dials, and I haven't turned a lot of those. I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've refrained from turning a lot of those. We turn them up to 11. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, if, if I could just chime in there, Jim, the certainly earlier versions of the same model did have a complete, um, um, I guess, nutrient cycles for both phosphorus and for, uh, and for nitrogen. So I think as Dale intimated, it's all in there. You know, how it's currently set, I guess that's something um, for the tribe and others to look at in the future. Uh, Robert. Thank you. I just had a, a quick question. Just the loading, which are characterizing that goes into the model to represent the lake from the rivers, is that including a dissolved component, a particulate component, and potentially a bed load component? Or is it just representing some subset of that? There, so no, there is there is no bed load component. Uh, what I what I've done is I've taken uh, the the USGS WRTDS uh, software, and I've and I've done the the complete loading, uh, and then and then uh, from that I've uh, used the estimated daily concentrations. Uh, to, uh, to uh, run the daily loads into the system. Yes. Thank you. And James. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, I, I know once upon a time we talked about uh, a more complicated uh, model from the sediment to the water interface. And, and uh, one, I guess, do you, do you think we have the information that we need uh, from the permeability information uh, from the, the sediment to the water interface to, to move forward with that, and then also the, uh, the biogeochemical information. So I have done some work with the sediment diagenesis model, the candy, uh, that's, that's associated with the, with the model, uh, just, just enough to really get the, that, that candy submodel running. The issue with that is for Katum, with using Katum, I have to turn off the geochemistry model and the organic metals and toxicity functions to get the, the uh, diagenesis uh, sediment model up and running. So I can't, I can't run both at the same time. I can't run zinc limitation and then run the sediment diagenesis component at the same time, which is a real issue. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to jump in with a, a question now. One of the things I noticed in uh, one of the stations, Dale, was uh, there was a significant mismatch in the, the thermocline depth. Um, I can't remember if, if the model or the measurements were higher. Um, I was wondering what you're doing for long wave radiation inputs, because I think in earlier presentations, uh, you just have the standard meteorological data. Yes. Yeah, so for the long wave, I've I've taken um, there's there's the long wave cloud cover. It's it's a it's it's a scale from zero to one essentially. And so what I've done is I've taken the uh, theoretical 
um, long wave radiation model outputs for this for this area, and then I uh, um, estimated from the short wave radiation or um, what what that long wave radiation should be, what the cloud cover should be uh, for each day. I know I didn't explain that well, but it is an estimate. It is an estimate of that long wave radiation. It is not measured. And it's and it's fairly low resolution because it's it's only for a single day. So a cloudy day would be one, and of course a a, a sunny a, a pure sunny day would be I guess closer to closer to zero. No, that's just the opposite. It'd be just the opposite. Excuse me. <laughs> I, I've been through that exercise, so I, I know exactly what you're saying or, or trying to say. Okay. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, uh, and I, I guess maybe that feeds into my other question. I noticed that there was there's a lot more variability shown in many of the measured parameters, even though the model is getting the trend right. Um, it seems to be you know, a monotonic decrease or increase, um, which makes me think that there's some dynamism missing in the inputs. Uh, and maybe you know, that long wave assumption is certainly one source of that. Um, and may, did I hear you correctly that you're using daily averages for the inputs for everything else, or, or is it, it a near instantaneous inputs? So, so do you mean do you mean for the you mean for the weather station data in general? Well, for weather station and even for say for. Um, Hydrologic inputs, stream flows. Yeah. Okay. So for the so for the hydrologic inputs, it is it is a daily it is a daily um, a discharge value, for instance. So it's just that it's that daily single discharge value per day. The weather station data is on five minute um, increments. So and it's yeah. So so the model runs on that five minute increments. But but for the actual river forcing, it it is a uh, single daily daily value. And so the site that I think you're, I think you're, what you're referring to is site C5, which is that shallow southern site that is really, it, it's highly affected by wind. And uh, there's, there's multiple metal limnians at times. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's a shallow epilimnian with one very long metal limnian to the, uh, to, to, to the um, hypolimnian, to a very, a very shallow hypolimnian. So I think there's a lot of wind energy that's really moving moving that that metalimian around at c5 okay uh, well, anyway, well thank you and i guess in the interest of time we need to to move on and the next presenter is uh, bob steed good morning am i showing up here yes you are i guess good morning to to some and good afternoon to the rest um i'm i'm bob steed i'm also getting a phone call at the same time here um, I'm, I work for the Coeur d'Alene Regional Office and I've uh, uh, recently moved into a leadership role where I'm providing guidance to our LMP section. Um, previously, I worked in TMDLs and uh, FERC relicensing and that type of stuff. Um, what, what I, I wanted to make the, the committee aware and, and the rest of the attendees aware that there's another model that has been, um, it really hasn't been used over the last decade, um, but there is a W2 model that has been set up um, for the Coeur d'Alene system. Um, and it was really uh, a part of the uh, relicensing for the Post Falls Dam. Uh, a Vista uh, Utilities uh, had an alternative licensing process where they set up a committee and the committee was supported by um, Golder Associates with, with W2 modeling for the, for the system. And again, it, it really hasn't been used in a decade. Um, it is a, a two-dimensional model with the ability to branch to, to take um, certain uh, bays and, and incorporate that. And there has been some in, improvements on that, but it does sediment diagenesis, particle transport, and has a eutrophication model. Um, again, this was used for the relicensing. It was, it was completed back in 2003 through 2005. That model is in version 3.1. I, I believe that they're up to 4.2. So there's, it, it is kind of outdated on that. Um, one of the, the nice features of it though, is it was calibrated and validated and it does have the documentation of those calibration sessions and um, 
um, and, and the output. Um, keep in mind that, that W2 was really used as a tool to evaluate the potential changes in water quality that would result from Avista operations of that Post Falls Dam. So really the main scenarios that were run on that were um, with the dam present and with you know, existing conditions and then if the dam was, was, uh, was missing. And we used a lot of those outcomes to determine um, what impairments the dam was causing to the Coeur d'Alene Lake system. Uh, the domain is, is pretty extensive. It does go all the way up the Coeur d'Alene River um, and a portion, all of the inundated portion of the St. Joe River as well. Um, the, uh, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I wanted to, to bring up that we do use um, W2 modeling on the Spokane River for TMDLs. We've used that in the past, as well as the uh, um, Ponderé River system as well for, for temperature issues. Um, I, I suppose this is just to show, you know, to, to demonstrate that we, we do have um, the hydrology and um, those components have been built into this model. Um, and uh, again, this is just a picture of the, the, you know, some of the calibration data. It has gone through those steps. You can see that it calibrates well with data that, that, that has uh, good information on it and, and it it, but when the, the information is kind of a shotgun, it's not as well cal calibrated in those, those situations. So, so what, what I'm, I'm concerned with is I'm trying to, to work on what's the best um, use of our team for, um, for modeling for the lake management plan in Coeur d'Alene Lake. Um, and I really think that, that a, a progression for us is to start looking at what modeling runs, what goals do we have for modeling, and what scenarios need to be prepared to, to address that modeling. Um, there is some potential in, in using W2 um, because we do have uh, some internal DEQ folks that are capable of running it. Um, we also have uh, contractors that are, uh, that are available for us as well with W2. Um, our, our history with the tribe, they've done a great job with, with AEM3D. Um, it is a complicated model run and we've, we've kind of fallen into the, the role with the, the tribe on this as that they're running it and we're just feeding them, them data for calibration and, and that type of, of situations. Um, and if we need to do it ourselves or have it contracted, um, again, I want the team to focus on, on coming up with what are the, what scenarios do we need to be run for modeling? And certainly any, any out, you know, any advice that we get from the committee would be uh, well, well received. Um, some of the cons is that the, the, the update is required. And we also have some concerns with the, the, the past predicted water quality conditions that they, they, they vary with a, a huge degree of accuracy and resolution. Uh, one of the, the the, that model was calibrated with the 91, 90, or 90, 91 data that you've seen on a lot of these charts. And you can see we've got significant amount of data to better calibrate a model with. Um, and then one of the big problems that we ran into is the, the wind sheltering coefficient was insufficient. It had to be estimated. And my understanding is that's one of the big knobs on the W2 model for calibration. Um, since then we have, we have, um, there is now data available to address the wind sheltering issue. Um, I got a lot of the information for this presentation from PSU. Um, and then there are two very thick volumes of the results and the calibration of the W2 model back in 2005. And I can take any questions, but my, my main purpose of this presentation is just to let the committee members know that there is a a dormant model that, that was developed and, and available. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, I see we have a question from Laura. Possibly more than one question. Just, just a quick question. I, I, I wondered if maybe Dale could provide his thoughts on the use of W. AEM3D, do you feel like you're, you're far enough along and you have more processes that you can consider with the AEM3D model that you don't see any utility in developing W2? 
um, I'm just kind of curious since. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, my, my perspective with W2 was then this was from the industry licensing. It, 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 there wasn't a lot of calibration data. The model did not, did not do well, especially with some of the Southern sites uh, that, that we have modeled. We've also modeled, of course, I can mention this before, we, we modeled the lower Corling River and I've uh, run the model on Thompson and Swan Lakes. Most of that is just temperature calibration, just, just kind of getting those set up to run. Um, overall, I don't know that much about uh, the uh, W2, but I, I, if I remember correctly from the eviscery licensing, it, it really just did not do a very good job. Um, okay, um, Robert. Sure, so I actually have a little bit of background on this because back when I was at Portland State University, I actually uh, did a peer review of that W2 model for Bob. Good to see you, Bob. <laughs> uh, but so the limitations of W2 is one, it's a two-dimensional model. Um, and it doesn't really have a lot of the, the, the metal kind of chemistry. You can certainly put that into W2, but that would be a lot of work. Um, and if the current model that Gail has already has that incorporated, that might be an advantage. Where I think W2 could be useful is the fact that it would run faster. Um, and if it can be shown to sort of dial in the hydrodynamics and dial in temperature, things like that, the more basic uh, water quality constituents, that might be of utility to, to Gail and others who are doing the modeling to be able to sort of get those pieces right and understand the dynamics and the CSM, the conceptual site model, um, before moving on to, to using the more two-dimensional model. But, but there are the limitations of it being a 2D model. So I thought I'd throw that out there. Did, uh, did you have another question, Laura, or is your hand just frozen? Uh, it's just frozen, sorry. Uh, I, I get maybe I could follow up um, on Laura's question. Uh, so yeah, running 3D models is a is a complex complex activity, um, and, and one of the advantages of it over say a 2D model is that you can represent complex hydrodynamics and events that you alluded to, Dale, like you know, the internal wave field, and things like that. Um, maybe how far along are you and your team on looking at at those sorts of things whether they're they're there in the measure data and whether you're representing them in them with the model or or is that just not being on the sort of to-do list yet yeah we just so we we just haven't got there yet with that um that just that takes so much time and, and, and energy and and we've, we've been collecting a lot of data we've been in the field a lot uh, so we, we really haven't, and we're a very small program, so we really haven't had a chance to do that. I think maybe one of the ways we could have definitely improved that is, you know, go get out there and uh, do the CTD work, get that higher resolution temperature data, uh, you know, because right now we're really just relying mostly on, on the, uh, you know, HydroLab profile uh, work. So it, there's, there's a vast amount of, of um, potential to do more work with on this model. Um, I'm just an empirical limnologist. I'm not a modeler. I'm just using it as a tool and, and uh, trying to understand it. And it has helped us significantly with understanding the lake, but there's a lot more that can be done with it, of course. Well, you uh, or somebody else earlier on alluded to, um, I guess, some, uh, uh, some, some buoys that were out there collecting continuous data. What was the um, What's the time frequency on those data? Okay, so, so yeah, so those were the that, that was the uh, the uh, profiler buoy that was out there. It um, I had it set up in several ways. Actually, I would have it taking uh, uh, profiles uh, four times a day. You know, every every six hours. Sometimes I I was I had it you know working at um, you know taking profiles every three hours at uh, generally one meter increments it kind of changes because of the way it it it, it uh, profiles however there's a there's a lot of data available there that I really haven't had a chance to pour through 
and apply directly to to the model. Now, I, I was just thinking if there was, say, even higher frequency data at a point somewhere, um, it would be possible to resolve if if the internal wave field does exist and if it is significant, um, and then whether the model could pick it up. But anyway, that was more a statement than a than a sure. question. Yeah, and yes, and yeah, I mean, like I say, there's a lot of room to there's, there's a lot of data to work with. And, and, and use. I'm a I'm more of a food web uh, person and not necessarily a physical modeler. So I think uh, given the model in the right hands with the data, um, that there'd be vast improvements. Okay, well, thank you. Um, can I bring one last thing up on on that? Um, sorry, you know, we're the the state of Idaho. We we have. Um, I very much respect and, and appreciate the work that the tribe has done on the AEM3D model. Um, but it really uh, initially started out that we'd be working on it together. Um, it, there's a really good reason why you can't work on it together because it, it, it takes one, one chief to be running that, that, that situation. So we, um, we're kind of locked out of modeling from the state's perspective on getting models, you know, getting model runs completed to meet the objectives of what we're asking for it. And, you know, Dale needs three Dales to do the amount of work that, that you know, that, that needs to be done on that, that front. But we, we do need, you know, documented uh, versions of the models so that we know which one we're wor working on. We uh, need calibration. You know, I've, I've seen more calibration today than, than, than is documented yet. I think that's the right model for most of our applications, but because of its complexity and um, be, because we don't really have our hands on the knobs on, on any of that kind of stuff, nor do we have the resources to do that. Um, that's why we're looking to really focus our section on describing what our modeling goals are and developing the scenarios that we need um, simulated. Okay, thank, thank you for the, uh, for that description, Bob. Okay, um, let's move on to our final presenter for this session, um, and that's uh, Kim Prespo from EPA. Good morning, <clears throat> afternoon. Thank you. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Okay, does everybody see that? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, thank you. I'm uh, Kim Prespo. I'm a remedial project manager at EPA and part of the Bunker Hill team. And so today I'm going to take us back into the lower basin and I'm going to go about a thousand feet higher than where we've been talking um, this morning because I um, will try to provide a very brief summary on the fate and transport of the contaminated sediment in the lower basin and really just focusing on particulate lead as it relates to the lake. So I'll pro provide some key characteristics of the system and then Tyler Jansen will introduce our numerical model. <clears throat> so our work is performed under the 2002 Record of Decision, or ROD, which has provided a general understanding at the time and a path forward um, based on the information that we had. And we really renewed our focus on the lower basin in 2008. Uh, and it was in part to address recommendations made by the National Academy of Science Studies, which included refining the conceptual site model, understanding issues with recontamination, um, and developing a, a numerical and sediment transport model. So the enhanced CSM is an understanding of how the sediment transport in the basin works. The numerical model is an important tool that we've used to inform that. The work is documented in many technical memos which are available for your review and I will not be able to begin uh, to get into the, the details of, of our work today. So the Bunker Hill Superfund complex is divided into the upper and the lower basin and EPA has addressed, generally addressed contamination uh, starting in the uh, upper tributaries in the lower, in the South Fork, and then moving down into the lower basin. And you can see the confluence of the North and the South Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River here. So the area shown in red contains over 18,000 acres with about 30 distinct marshes, wetlands, and lakes. It is a major flyway for migratory waterfowl and heavily used by people uh, recreating in the basin. The lower Coeur d'Alene River is, has highly uh, unusual and highly complex hydrodynamics with interconnected floodplains and channels along the route. These are two photos from a spring uh, 2008. It was a major overbank flood event. 
and it is these infrequent but large floods that mobilize contamination from the riverbed. So on average, uh, we've, we've estimated about 48,000 metric tons of contaminated sediment and 180 metric tons of particulate lead flow into the lake every year. And we estimate that 80% of the off-channel habitat is contaminated with lead concentrations that are acutely toxic to waterfowl. So this map shows the four primary USGS flow gauges. And uh, that they, these provide a record of the, of the river discharge and the water surface elevation in and at the boundaries of the lower basin. So the Cataldo dredge pond, Rebecca mentioned that on Wednesday, that is uh, located about river mile 160. And this marks the location above which we have a steeper braided reach which transitions to the more flatter, more to the flatter, more meandering reach that extends to the river's mouth at Lake Coeur d'Alene near Harrison. So a key variable affecting hydraulics, this was also discussed briefly on Wednesday, is that is, and it affects hydraulics and sediment transport is water levels of Coeur d'Alene Lake, which create a varying um, hydraulic backwater effect that extends as far up as River Mile 160. So lower lake levels during the winter can result in higher shear stresses in the channel, higher erosion and higher sediment transport. And conversely, high lake, high lake levels can result in higher river and lateral lake levels, which could increase the duration of an overbank flow. So when coupled with these other factors, and as noted by other speakers, this variable um, high, um, discharge annually, and this uh, affects the erosion rates and the amount of sediment transport to the site. Our basin scale understanding is based on observed hydraulic suspended sediment data, multi-beam bathymetry, and numerous coring, coring investigations and this numerical model, which is used to fill in the spatial and temporal gaps. The main stem alone has more than 30 miles of contaminated sediment expen, extending to over 16 feet thick in places. The riverbed is eroding over time. We estimate between one and four centimeters per year, but unevenly and erosion is episodic. So during high flow events, um, and during these high flow events, particularly particulate lead is scoured from the bed and moves on downstream. The bathymetry work has helped to inform our investigations, map out units for the model and target areas for the cleanup. This shows the depositional and erosional features of a typical bend in the river. And our stratigraphic model for the riverbed shows a consistent chronological order of contaminated signature that reflects the history of mining at the site. There's a sharp interface between the native materials that, um, and the most contaminated silts from the earliest mining period. So this buildup of mine waste continued through the 1950s and 60s, but over the past decade, decade, six decades, episodic erosion has cut down through these materials. So until it reaches native material, sediment lead concentrations are expected to increase as these more highly concentrated legacy deposits are exposed. I'm going to talk briefly about the sediment and lead budget for the lower basin. And this is an accounting of the contaminated sediment entering the basin, what is stored in the bed and the banks, what is deposited outside the channel and the floodplains, and what enters the lakes. So suspended sediment sampling and the related USGS monitoring program provide solid evidence that for a given discharge, sediment transport increases downstream. As you can see from this chart here with the suspended sediment on the on the y-axis and discharge on the right, you can see that the range of SSC at Harrison is almost an order of magnitude higher than the suspended sediment SSC at Cataldo. And so these rating curves are the primary controls on the sediment fluxes that are computed for our sediment budget. So every budget requires sources and sinks. We estimate about 72,000 tons per year of the contaminated sediment is being transported through the basin. 44% is coming from upstream, 7% from bank erosion, and 49% is scoured from the riverbed between Cataldo and Harrison. As for the sinks, there's uh, much more uncertainty and variability, variability around the percentage of contaminated sediment that is deposited on the floodplain versus what is transported to the lake. But on average, we, we figure about one third is deposited on the floodplain with two thirds flowing into the lake. For sources of lead, almost three quarters of the lead is coming from the riverbed between Cataldo and Harrison, whereas 14% is coming from upstream. That's predominantly the South Fork, over 98%, an equal amount from the banks. So this is explained by the river gradually eroding through these legacy deposits and contaminated sediment that's stored in the bed. 
As for, for sinks, on average, 27% of the lead is deposited in the floodplain with the remaining going into the lake. So we've used our model to estimate how transport and volume of contaminated sediment will change over a 30 year period if the river were to naturally restore, so no remedial actions. And the model indicates that the volume of contaminated sediment could, could decrease um, during these high flow events, would, would decrease by about 25% over this period. But due to these deeper legacy deposits, the lead concentrations within the sediment that it's transported to the lake will probably increase until the river ultimately erodes down to native material. So I'm, so I'm going to switch now and let uh, uh, Tyler talk just briefly about our numeric models. Yeah, thanks, Kim. So I'm going to talk briefly about the development and use of the numerical models as part of the lower basin remediation program. Uh, the numerical model is one part of the overall enhanced conceptual site model that Kim just described. So as Kim mentioned earlier, the lower basin riverbed is complex, variable, and dynamic. Um, the hydraulics of this system are complicated by flow leaving and re-entering the channel via tide channels and overbank flow, and by variable backwater conditions in the lake itself. So the numeric models of the lower basin uh, consist of a 1D model of hydrodynamics only and a 2D model of both hydrodynamics and sediment transport. Next. Numeric models of this system allow us to enhance and validate the conceptual site model to provide spatial and temporal resolution that are not available from observations to predict future conditions and also to predict the response of this system to remediation. These models are supported by a large quantity of observed data collected over more than 10 years in the basin that have been partially described by other speakers. Next. The 1D hydraulics model is built using HEC RAS. Uh, we use it for long-term simulations, for answering questions related to hydraulics, where these 1D approximations are sufficiently accurate, and also for, flood, for forecasting uh, flood events to inform data gathering during those events. Next. The 2D hydraulics and sediment transport model is built using DHI's Mike 21C. The 2D model includes more accurate hydraulics than, than the 1D, but consequently takes much longer to run. Uh, so simulating one year uh, takes about one day of computational time. The 2D model is used for evaluating remedial actions, enhancing and validating the conceptual site model, such as the sediment budget that Kim just described and for understanding the interaction of these complex processes in the lower basin itself. Uh, back to you, Kim. Okay, so just to wrap up a few takeaways um, from this talk, riverbed erosion is a dominant source of lead contamination in the lower bed, in the lower basin. Inflow from the South Fork and bank erosion are secondary sources. It is eroding through a layer cake of sediments that are deposited, that were deposited during this mining period. So we expect that lead concentrations of suspended sediment could increase over time. Uh, transport occurs primarily during these high flow events, but is very affected by seasonal flow and by lake levels. So on average, a large fraction of the contaminated sediment and lead moving into the lower basin enters the floodplain, the rest enters Coeur d'Alene Lake. So our model has estimated that in any given year, the model rate of flow plain deposition, flood plain deposition could range from anywhere from 6% to 62% of the sediment that is flexed into the lake. So the model has been hugely um, informative for us. And I, I just wanna say for going forward, we have a good understanding of, uh, much better understanding of the system as a whole. And now we'll be using this um, ongoing observational data and the model to target specific source areas within the channel to compare these tech various technologies and, and look at what is most effective at reducing contaminant transport um, into the floodplains and to the lake. So thanks very much. Uh, well, thank you, Kim and, and Tyler. Um, I'm going to just try to limit the questions from the panelists to the one that uh, has a raised hand now because we wanted to open it up to questions from the public. So Robert, please go ahead. Thank you, I'll keep it short. Uh, this is a, a question maybe for Kim to start, maybe Tyler adds in, but you mentioned that 49% of the load, uh, is, the sediment load is coming from the bed of the river. Is that being all resuspended 
or is some of that becoming dead load that goes downstream? I think I heard um, you were asking if most of it's suspended or some of it's from bed load. Is that, can you just rephrase the very end? Okay. Yeah, so you mentioned in one of your slides, 49% of the contaminated sediment that's coming to the lake is coming from bed erosion. And so I'm curious if your modeling and your data indicates that that is suspended material or is it bed load? Tyler, why don't you, you might be able to make that distinction better. Yeah, so most of it is suspended. Um, certainly there is some bed load. Um, a lot of the material in the bed is quite fine. Um, so once it is eroded, it is suspended and it stays in the water column um, until it either goes to the floodplain or to the lake itself. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you. So now I guess I'm going to ask Sam or Laura, how do we get questions in from the from the, from the rest of the world. Right, well, uh, we will move on now to questions from the audience. And Eric, can you give uh, people in the audience a, a, a little instruction as to how they can ask a question? So, so are you taking over now, Sam? Uh, can you hear me? Oh boy. I, I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm taking over now, Jeff. So who's in the audience? I see some people have already started raising their hands. So if you start raising your hands, we'll kind of pull you over to the panelist side and you'll have the ability to unmute yourself and to turn on your microphone or turn on your webcam. So go ahead and uh, raise your hand and we'll take care of it from there. And once you get over onto the panelist side, if you can raise your hand one more time, and then Sam will see your hand is raised and he can start calling on people. Oh, well, well, there we go. Okay, uh, Bonnie Douglas. Oh, sorry, Sam, if you can stay on the panelist tab, that's where, you're, that's where the, the raised hands will be that you can call on. Hello. So, so right now you should see uh, Robert McFarland has his hand raised. Yep, just got it. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Robert McFarland. Bonnie, we'll get you later. Okay. If you could, yeah, thank you. Uh, it looked from the diagram of the sediments that in the historical mining era, uh, lead laden sediments had been laid down and then less contaminated sediments over that. But now we're digging back through. Is there a reason why we're having net scouring and picking up of the lead in the water column now? Yeah, our understanding is that uh, that overall, it's it, the, the whole system is net erosional. So it is just based on the sediment budget. It, it has told us that um, that that the river is definitely net erosional. However, it's variable. There's places in the river where it's um, deposited and there's places where it's, there's more erosion. Okay, it sounds like it's dynamic and maybe the sediments are moving downstream gradually. Would that be That's, a possibility? Yes, that, that, the data indicates that with just the higher concentrations of suspended, uh, suspended sediment concentrations in Harrison versus what's coming into Cataldo and just the increased amount of lead in the suspended sediment is that it is moving its way downstream. But based on these variable storms and also lake levels, in a given year, more might be deposited in the floodplain versus what ends up in the lake. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bonnie Douglas. Uh, yes, uh, I have uh, two questions. One was, um, and Kim, maybe or um, maybe this is uh, for Tyler. The it was given as a statistic earlier that lead level was increasing in the Harrison area. Mm -hmm. That's an area where we have a, a beach that's um, used by children. <laughs> and if if this is true, that we're getting down to uh, scouring out higher lead concentrated um, deposits, you know, in the sediment, I'm, it's very concerning to me that um, for recreation in that area. And the other thing is boat wakes and it has nothing's been mentioned about side erosion, but we have boats now that that churn up a lot, lot more uh, wake and um, 
and affect the erosion from the sides. And I wonder if, if not having boats come into uh, the river, you know, if there's a way to um, help the situation. And yeah, thank you, Bonnie. We have, we have, we don't have a lot of data on the direct effect of the boat wakes, but it is certainly a, been a concern all along. And, and um, you know, there is some impact. I think a number of things that could be impacting the, the, uh, the effects on the sides of the river. So um, it, it's, but, it, but one, one thing we have looked at is it seems that the, the banks of the river appear to be less of a contributor in terms of than the riverbed itself. And then in terms of the, I don't know if Tyler wants to add anything more on the Harrison, but where we're measuring this is at the Harrison gauge. Um, uh, so in terms of the actual, we are looking at it at recreational sites throughout the basin and, and monitoring those and, and are using a number of a number of ways to mitigate um, exposure to people recreating in the basin. And I just wanted to clarify, Kim, on the um, what the, what some of the projections are of as the erosion cuts down into these more concentrated sediments is actually that the total sediment load over time decreases a little bit because we're starting to to use up the available sediment. Um, and same thing with the total lead, but it's the the concentration of lead on sediment that increases over time because we're getting down to that very that more highly concentrated sediment. So it's the it's that concentration on sediment. That's change, that is increasing, not so much the total lead that is uh, going down the river. And I don't see any more questions from the audience, Eric. Do you, are there some uh, that I'm not seeing? Yeah, so we do have them numbered. Uh, so you should see numbers in front of their names on your participants. Yeah, so you have number three and number five. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Richard Meyer. Yes, I wonder if the uh, lead is coming through the Coeur d'Alene River, is there any way to either put a, um, a retainer on that, a, a restaining, retaining dam, or some way to treat the river itself to keep that lead from hitting the, uh, the main lake? Or yeah, seal the bottom of the lake, of the uh, river. Is there some way to stabilize that. Yes, the, these are all things that we are evaluating. We are in the process now, and Anne Marie, and I, who's probably on the on the line here, um, who's the lead for the channel. Um, we've got several different pilots that we're evaluating, and one of the focus areas I didn't even have a chance to uh, spend time on is up in the Dudley Reach, where we've identified as one of the, the potentially largest sources of particulate lead. So we've got, uh, we're right now evaluating several different pilot projects. And one of them includes um, various combinations of capping and dredging in the river. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Jim Duff. Jim Duff. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Question is, uh, and this would be for Kim, I believe. Uh, why have the uh, uh, stream or the river uh, sedimentation dynamics changed? And that's the sense I get from a net uh, depositional to now a net erosional uh, regime. So during the mining period, which really extended up through the through 1968 or so, end of the 60s, there was um, a lot of, as Ed alluded to, there was a lot of um, transport and tailings and dumpings of tailings into these uh, into the stream. It all moved its way down stream into the lower Coeur d'Alene River. There were several episodes where they had built um, plank dams, and these plank dams released um, during some flood events. Uh, were re released additional tailings. So there was just a gradual buildup of mining material all through that period until mining eventually was ceased in about at the end of the 1960s. And at that point, and Tyler is better to talk about the dynamics of the river, but at that point, the river just naturally starts to re-equilibrate and, and starts to erode 
like I say, it's a net, it's net erosion. So over time, um, it, st it starts to build, cut into the bed. So there are places we found that in the river where it does deposit and there are other places where it's more erosive, but, but in the net, it's, it's, it's continued to, it started to cut down starting after the end of the mining period. Is that, thank is that yeah, thank you very much for that clarification. I appreciate it. Uh, Sandy Emerson. Sandy Emerson. Sandy, you're me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a, um, in, you're getting all around my question, and that is the, uh, Toxic waste sink right at the mouth of the Coeur d'Alene River down toward Harrison by the uh, Harrison Dock Builders Association in Springston. I've seen the um, studies there that show 11,000 to 15,000 parts per million lead right there in a concentrated area. And that was actually historically used as kind of a uh, place that they were dumping intending to dump large amounts of mine waste. It's been discussed how to get rid of that over time rather than just letting it be capped because it's so huge and enormous. How does that factor into some of the things that we're talking about today? Sorry, I can get my new button there. Those are the concentrations that have been seen. If you um, recall the slide that I showed you, um, some of the, the more concentrated mining material at depth uh, that we've seen from our coring has been up in those concentrations of you know, 20, 30,000 parts per million. And um, so depending on uh, how much erosion has occurred and uh, whether those uh, legacy deposits are now at the surface. You, you know, you can see these these concentrations, and you know that's that is part of what our uh, challenge is, and what we're working on uh, now in terms of identifying these sources. We generally want to work upstream to downstream, and we know that there's some very high concentrated pockets up and again at the Dudley Reach. But you know, that's our goal is to is to incrementally start to remove or cap or you know take you know, remove them as sources as to the, to the lake and to the wetlands. Thank you. It's been said it was somewhere between 400 and 700 million tons, just primarily in that particular location or on through that. Is that accurate? I, yeah, I, I know there's been some very large numbers. I'm trying to think, Tyler, do you have the number that we've estimated for the bed itself? I don't have it in the top of my head, but it's, I don't have it on hand no. Yeah. But it's, it is a large amount of contaminated sediment that is sitting in the 30 miles and, you know, down through, I'm not sure specifically about the location that you're talking about, but. Well, the concern was that it would become remobilized uh, as we've been talking about all throughout. So it's a lot to work with. Thank you. Indeed. Uh, Adriana Hummer. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. And that um, previous question and answer partially addressed my question, but I was just curious about other remediation efforts. So we've talked a lot about all the data sets showing that the water is, um, you know, talking about water quality, but are there any other plans in hand right now um, to do further remediation aside from what was just discussed? to improve the quality or are we still in the data collection and analysis phase? Well, I think Ed um, talked a lot about the, we have a lot about the, all of the remediation efforts that EPA has been conducting throughout the upper basin. And of course we have focused on the upper basin initially. It's again, it's more of this top-down approach. So in addition to all of the work that has been done up in the tributaries, um, and the, the groundwater collection system that's been installed in the South Fork and a, you know, a variety of work done at the mine and mill sites in the upper basin, we are starting to, do, to have some efforts 
down in the lower basin, but it there was a definite need to really understand the system and make sure that if we did put something into place, we weren't going to recontaminate it again, or just really understand that if we if we tackled the section of the river, that it was, you know, it was going to move the needle for us, that we were really going to have an effect on the suspended sediment, contaminated sediment going into the floodplains and into the lake. Um, so so then in terms of the channel itself, we are on the cusp of, of developing some pilot projects. I would say in the next three years, we'll have um, we'll have some designs in place to to work on a, a section of the of that of the Dudley Reach. And we've also been working on cleaning up some of the wetlands. We have we have the Schlepp wetland that was done earlier on, and then um, we're currently working on what's known as Gray's Meadow now to create more clean feeding habitat. So to to remediate those um, impacted floodplain areas. Fred, I don't have a last name. Somebody named Fred? Okay. Can you hear me? Oh yes, I can hear you, you can go now. I, I'm sorry, I'm a, a property owner on the lake and I own properties probably in four of the areas that you guys have modeled. Um, I first I was first involved in the site back in the early 80s, working for Office of Research and Development, EPA down at EMSL Las Vegas. Um, later, I was uh, director of the mine waste management studies at the University of Idaho, where I received my master's and PhD. And I, uh, as, as part of the director, I put through about uh, 20 different master's students and PhD students. Uh, working on the mine and the, the areas around there. And uh, I did my master's down in the Bunker Hill mine itself. And the PhD I did was out on uh, Smelterville Flat. So I'm, I'm really familiar with the site and I still live in the area. And I'm a, you know, a, a downstream interest now in my, in, in my later years. Um, I, I enjoyed all of the discussions, but I had kind of a, the big question was, I missed the opening statements. And um, I was curious, what is the purpose and objectives of this group? And, uh, you know, what is your charge and, and who, who, uh, who issued the charge to you guys to do this? Uh, I'm glad to clear all that up in the, uh, in the final statements. Uh, let's finish up the questions here and then I'll, then I'll, I'll summarize uh, restating our charge and, 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 uh, and the, the sponsors. Uh, if that's right, okay thank with you. you. Thank sure, sure. Uh, let's see, I think we have a question also from Jamie Sturgis. If you can connect. Jamie, are you able to connect? Okay, here we go. Can you hear us? Yes. Hello. This is Jamie Sturgis by telephone to Jamie Bruner to the internet. And uh, I don't have the ability to do audio right now and send because of where I'm located. But I wanted to just, I'm so excited about the uh, moving forward, the moderator, the panelists, the committee, and expectations are high. I do have one question, which I won't be able to hear the answer to, unfortunately. But I'm curious, with the annual raising and lowering of the high pool and low pool, does that mitigate or aggravate sediment flux into the river in the chain lakes area? And I'll just wait for that answer and respect everybody. You want to take that, Tyler? I think yeah, it complicates it for sure. And I think Kim mentioned this at the beginning of hers. So during, during high pool, um, the shear stress on the river is less, so there's less erosion. It lasts for longer, and because the lake level is higher, more water goes to the floodplain. So you have more water and more sediment going to the floodplain, but you have less erosion on the channel. Um, during low pool, the shear stresses on the channel are higher. There's more erosion for a given flow rate, um, but there's less connectivity to the floodplain, and so more proportionally more of that sediment during the low pool events goes to the lake. So it, it, it's very event de uh, dependent. It depends on um, the dynamics, the flow rate, and the length of that event. There are some short duration winter events when there's low pool 
that cause just as much scour and as much total sediment as long duration spring um, high pool events. And so it's it's hard to say that it that the the change in pool um, helps or hurts the the sediment flux to the floodplain or the lake, but it certainly complicates and it's an event uh, event specific discussion. Thank you. Let's see. I'm waiting to see if there's any more. Do I have any more coming up, Eric? I think there's one more that's coming over. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the pause here, folks. There we go, should be a number there now. Well, I see, Jane. I have the only number I see is Jamie, let's see. Should be number nine. Well, the name is DDSZ. Okay, Could, would you wanna go ahead, sir, or ma'am, whichever it is. I don't see it on mine, but that's all right. Oh yeah, DDSZ, there we go, thank you. So DDSZ, whoever that is. D D S Z. I guess we don't have anybody there uh, that can that's able to connect. Um, and so, Eric, do we have any? Uh, do we have any uh, open mic? Um, anybody in the open mic list that wasn't on here? Um, I don't think so. Oh, I don't there think we go. I got. I've got a new one. Wait a minute. Is it? Oh no! Did I get Sky Walden? No, Whoop, I'm, I'm just uh, coming in over this way. Um, you guys are talking a lot about um, future projects being capping, um, which I've seen up upriver, but there's also still signs by the creek that say, don't touch the water. And, you know, I'm wondering when I've done independent research, I've seen like dredging and bioremediation as um, as ways to clean up the the existing lead. Is there any way that we could do something like that? And is there any way to repurpose the lead, like for MRI doors for hospitals, or like are we just trying to cap it again? We're looking at a number of alternatives. Capping is one, um, dredging is one. We've looked at various um, options like putting in weirs and wind fences. There's a, there's a variety of ways you can tackle this and it would not probably be the same throughout the entire riverbed. They all have their pros and their cons and um, well, you know, we're basically going to be starting kind of in a stepways, stepwise process, probably up at the Dudley Reach and testing some of these technologies, and it will probably be a combination. Um, in terms of repurposing the lead, um, EPA has not really, just due to the, the volume and um, difficulties of this system, it is not something that is really panned out, not something that we would look at um, on, a, on a grand scale. So a lot of, if we, do, if we do dredging, there needs to be a place on the site to place that material, which is why we have some well-managed um, repositories throughout the, the site. And we'd have to consider that as well for the lower basin. Thank you. Great. I think it's, uh, we're a little, quite a bit over time actually, but that doesn't matter. We're very glad to hear all the questions from the audience and the, from the public, but I think it's probably time that that we wrap up here. Uh, let me, as I promised the uh, one of the earlier questioners, I will reiterate uh, that our we are specifically our task is to specifically to focus on future water quality conditions in the lake, and we're collecting, looking at uh, available data. We're looking at trends. We're really interested in trends, and we're interested in in developing a base of understanding. Uh, or at least discussing and, and putting together a base of understanding that 
ties together the things that we are that we heard in these presentations today. Uh, it's from that base eventually that some of these more difficult questions hopefully will it will provide a, some help in in addressing the the uh, the question of what the future might hold, and uh, and 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 the other more complicated questions uh, that follow what to do next. Uh, so that's that's what we see as our contribution. The sponsors of the study are the Department of Environmental Quality, Kootenai County, the, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe and U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The National Academies Committee comes in at the request of the sponsors and with a, with a charge uh, defined by the sponsors. Uh, our next meeting will be in May. Uh, we'll, we'll, between now and May, the committee itself will start to drill down on some of these issues and uh, and and uh, and and put together, start, start to put together our report. But let me emphasize that we are in the early information gathering phase. So we don't have much in the way of answers right now, uh, but, but, uh, but we are gonna, we are gonna seriously look at and address, address these issues. Uh, let me make, let's see. I think that's the, oh, yeah, our, our meeting is in May uh, and recordings of this meeting will be available uh, next week on the National Academy's uh, website for the meeting which I presume you all have, uh, have access to, or we can get through Laura if you need it. Um, and uh, if there's anything else that you wanna add, Laura, go ahead. Otherwise I'll call the meeting to a close. And thank you all very much. Thanks panelists for the questions. Thanks presenters for all these excellent presentations. It's a great start. Uh, as Bob said, we're, we're kind of uh, starting, we're, we're, we're just beginning to get a feel for the system. So uh, we appreciate the great start that you've helped us with. Laura, anything else to add? Uh, I'll just say that uh, this, this meeting actually is not over for the committee members. They will be meeting next week in closed session. Those are internal deliberations. But after that meeting, we will be making information requests to the various study sponsors, as well as others who um, may have submitted comments uh, that we uh, can respond to. Um, so we look forward to everyone's continued participation. Uh, please be looking for communications from myself or for, from Cal Rosenfeld. Uh, and if you uh, need to ask us questions, please just feel free to send either one of us emails and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks everyone. Great. That's great. And, uh, and I should also add one last thing. We expect this process to expect a report in about a year and a half. I know to some of you that probably sounds like a long time, but but that's what, how much time these things take, and uh, the product in the end will provide a base for moving forward. I hope, and that's that's mm -hmm. our goal. So thanks very much for your participation. Thanks for your questions, and uh, and and uh, for all for for all for the invitation to be here, and and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see the most most the next public session in May. Thanks a lot. Thank you.